Dear Ada Yonat, we are so happy that you have accepted to come. Dear Hezi, we are so pleased that you do the chair and take the lead in this session. Dear all other speakers, I owe you a coming to Ralph Sutwa. He really in friendship helped to convince you to be here today. And I'm very grateful, Ralph, for what you did in order to shape this session together with me. Thank you so much. Now I pass it, pass the micro to Hezi. Okay. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes we, do. we can hear you. Okay, very good. Okay. I think uh, I'm very happy to chair this session. I entered the field of uh, <coughs> antibiotic resistance by mistake, actually. Maybe we'll talk about it later, but I think it's one of the most important fields in medicine today and one of the larger challenges in medicine today. Uh, you know, it seems that as it was shown by the CDC and by the WHO, that by 2050, this will be killer number one in the world. And, and I think, you know, in a way, it's very similar to what ho happened with the climate. Every now, everyone knows there is a disaster, but very few people care. And I think that's really very, very bad. But we'll, maybe we'll talk about it later. Uh, and I think this session is very good because the speakers come from many disciplines. There are, uh, there are physicians, there are uh, regulatory people, uh, and there are scientists, and there are people from industry. So we have a really a very versatile and, and very broad spectrum session, and that I think is very important. Well, we are lucky to have as, as our first speaker, Professor Ada Yonat, Yonat from the Weizmann Institute. Uh, I don't think I have to say too much about Ada, but she, of course, the first thing that she's a, a Nobel laureate, but what is more important is she, that she's focusing now on translation of the genetic code to proteins and, and ribosome uh, and dealing with antibiotic hampering this process, where of course we know that ribosome are involved. And, and I think through this, uh, maybe, not maybe, she presented really a very novel and very innovative approach uh, that we are, we are very happy and very glad to hear and learn about it. Ada, the floor is yours. What happened? You are both muted, also Hezi. I don't know why I'm why I'm muted, but uh, I'm not muted now, and Ada is not it, muted either. I am. I'm not muted. You but are I, still. I don't have the, uh, the the screen. Okay. Not so okay. Anyway. No, I mean they have to deal with it. I cannot do much from here. <laughs> anyway. I want to, to wish you a happy birthday. Thank you, thank you. Hey, can you come? have him or miss? Thank you. I appreciate it. I really appreciate it. From you especially. And uh, I hope that everybody that has a birthday sometime will enjoy my, my good wishes. <laughs> okay. And, uh, I want to talk about next generation eco-friendly we just heard about the two things, about the antibiotics and the ecology. So I'll talk about both. I'm sure you all know the central dogma. <clears throat> I, I don't see the slide. 
You don't see the slide? No, I see only you. You look beautiful, but I don't see the slide. So what shall I do? I want what other people see, but I don't see. What shall I do? Yeah. You just have to um, click on share screen in Zoom. I don't have a screen. Can I can <laughs> I let can I let her do it? Yes, um, the, uh, Mrs. Janet, you have to do it yourself. Uh, this is. Um, I, I did it a minute ago. Yeah. You saw that I did it. Yes, we, this was a test, and then we tested another presentation. So your presentation were out. I see. Now and I understand. Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Here, okay. Wonderful. And in full screen. Just go to the slide, to the lab, to the full full screen slide. Right? Full screen. Yeah. I am trying to do this. Okay. I hope that they will not disconnect me again. This, you have to click on the icons. Um, yeah, uh, below. I have to get to the icon. Um, the icon next to the Zoom function uh, below, below, uh, in the bottom of your screen. Yes, next to the minus. Yeah, perfectly. Okay, very good. But, but I have here something that I don't want to see. <laughs> so skip it. It's easy to say skip it, but... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Ada, I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, now it doesn't go back. Something is wrong today. I give so many of those. Wait, I have to go to the beginning of the talk. Do you see now? Yeah, but go to the slide now. Now it's good. Next generation eco-friendly, do you see? Yeah, 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 yeah. We see that's it. perfect. We see it perfectly. Good. So I will talk about next generation eco-friendly antibiotics. These are the two um, issues that were just mentioned by the chair and the how to fight resistance is what I will try to tell you what we are doing for it. So I think that you all know that the proteins are being made according to the code in the DNA. The DNA is first transcribed to messenger RNA and then, but now I don't see my, my mouse. Do you see my mouse? Okay, and then become protein. Messenger RNA, this two, last two years became very popular and very everybody knows about it. Earlier it was nothing. Okay, so this is the central dogma about how proteins are being made. The ribosomes in vivo act continuously. They can form up to 40 peptide bonds in a second. They hardly make mistakes. Now, when I was a student, I had to make a peptide bond, a single one, and it took me six hours, and I was the first in class. So you see the ribosomes, how smooth they work. So just to, to explain quickly, the ribosome works with amino acids that are brought by tRNAs. On the right side, you see a, a pink tRNA that has... Oh, you, Wonderful. Here an anti-codon side and an amino acid that is uh, connected or dictated by the, by the anti-codon is bound to it. It goes into the ribosome. <coughs> the messenger RNA already sits there and waits. And then it will come to this position, to the pink position. Meanwhile, two tRNAs in two sites that we call A and P, amino acylated and peptidyl, are making a bond. The protein will come out through a tunnel. This, this the tRNA will go in, the whole thing will move, and this one will go out like the other one. And the protein is being made throughout. So right in the beginning, when we got the structures, 
took a long time to get the structures, to de determine the structures. But right when we got it, uh, we had, didn't take long time until we understood how they work. And we made a, a small, uh, small movie, small clip, which doesn't work now, or works, together with two, two students of the Art Academy in Jerusalem. So here, messenger RNA emits the ribosome in its small subunit. I told you earlier, it has two subunits. It gets into its, its path with the help of, uh, of factors. Now, when it sits in the path, the first RNA can come with the amino acid that it carries, and it is itself carried by this blue thing, which is initiation factor two. Once everything is fine, the two initiation factors can leave, and the large subunit can come and make a bridges to the small one. Now we have a ribosome. And the amino acids can be brought on tRNAs with factors, elongation factors, that bring them in. And right quickly, they read or they adjust themselves to the, to the messenger RNA. And a protein is being made here. So if we took away the large subunit, we left only the tunnel through which the protein go out. You can see in the small subunit how messenger progresses in the tRNA on this. Now we put the whole ribosome again, and you can see that the protein is growing up and coming out of the, of the uh, ribosome. And the whole process continues until there is a stop codon, a codon that says that's it, we finished. And then another factor bar come, release factor, and the two subunits can be separated. The protein, this blue thing can go and do what it needs. And that's it, the protein is being made. So this, this takes really a few seconds. When we look at the structures themselves of the ribosome, both large and small subunits are made of a lot of RNA, ribosomal, <coughs> sorry, ribosomal RNA, and many ribosomal proteins, which are shown here in, in many colors. The RNA is in gray. And just to remind you, the small one, small subunit, is responsible for decoding uh, the large subunit for peptide bond formation. So actually it happens when they are together, small is up here, large is down there. tRNA connects the two active sites, the decode, decoding center and the peptide bond formation site, which is called P, PTC. And you can see here also the entrance of the messenger RNA into its path to there. So it's really a very clever system and very, very efficient. Because of the fundamental role that plays by the ribosome, antibiotics target them. Over 40% of the clinically useful antibiotics target protein biosynthesis, mostly by paralyzing the ribosome. So they, they have a sure a winning if they stop the ribosome there will not be a protein, so the cell that they attack will die. Actually, the natural antibiotics are, are uh, not what human made. They are the weapons that bacteria from one type is using for interfering with cell life of different species, of different microorganisms. It's part of the bacteria against bacteria role. And the question is, how do they do it? Bacterial ribosomes are of molecular weight of two and a half million Daltons, and antibiotics about 500 to 1,000. So how these little ones are disturbing the large one is by binding to their active sites. So you see here many, many types of antibiotics, many uh, families, I won't go into detail, but you also see that each of them is troubling one of the uh, important uh, functions of the ribosome. So 
for this too, we made a little, a little uh, clip with the same two students. And I want to tell you that this, this uh, movies became very important and very rewarding because one of the art students became a biochemist. He's now getting his PhD at Harvard. So I think at least this we did. But it doesn't go. Okay, so you see here an antibiotic that is called adedein. It sits here, so small, so clever. You will see how clever it is in a minute. It was uh, developed in Poland and it's not allowed, it's uh, not allowed to use it now because it hardly distinguish between the patient and the pathogen. But I think that it's so clever that I wanted to show it to you. Look how clever. Just disturbs the motion of the messenger. So small. And the second one that I want to show is tetracycline, which is even smaller. And it disturbs the positioning of the tRNA in the first site, in what we call A site. Just sits in and blocks the binding. These are two natural antibiotics. Now you will see one that blocks the tunnel. It call, it's called erythromycin. And it's the first ribosomal antibiotic that was in use right after penicillin. So it sits in the tunnel and blocks it, and I'll come back to it a few times. And the last one is, is really, really, it's even more clever than the rest. It goes into the bond position. You see? Just disturbs the bond. So these, these are uh, several uh, examples how ribosomal antibiotics work. Actually, they bind to ribosomal functional sites, and these are highly conserved. All ribosomes perform translation in the same, it means almost the same, in bacteria and in human. And mandatory for clinical use, it's the distinction between the patient and the pathogen. Uh, this is what we want. And question is, how do the antibiotics differentiate between pathogens and patients? So I, I will not talk much about it, but I will show you some subtle differences. So here we look into the tunnel in the large subunit. This is the tunnel for which the protein should pass. And it is blocked partially, but enough by erythromycin, this is the red thing inside here. If we look at it from the side, this is the tunnel. This is erythromycin, the red. This is the tRNA with the second amino acid. And here the bond has been made and the new protein wants to go out, but cannot because the tunnel is blocked by erythromycin. So, there are several uh, families of uh, blockers that are called macrolides. And you can see here several of them. We look at the, at the tunnel wall perpendicular to its length. And you see here, I don't even want to say all the names, but uh, this is the way they go. How, how does a uh, resistant to them happen? Or how, how, what, is the, what are the clues of interactions? So you see here in the, in the erythromycin and part of the tunnel that is in position 2058 and it's adenine. Everything is fine. The contacts here are wonderful clinically. But the resistant type has here G instead of A. And then the distances here are too short and the antibiotic doesn't bind. So this is natural resistance. Oops. Actually, we found later, this is not the only way. The, the way I showed you earlier is the simplest. 
and the uh, most common that actually we found, if we look, here are the three tRNAs, and they are bound to the tunnel. And the tunnel mainly is, uh, the walls are made of RNA, but four proteins do exist near the tunnel, sorry. UL4, UL22, oh, which are the important of the four, you can see them here and here. And we found that there is a way to, to acquire resistance by motions far away, and far away from at the end of the ribosome. It's, a, it's very long, long way, almost a hundred angstroms. That their, their tips are motion, have a motion. You can feel some of the motions, and then they block the tunnel. So this is a, another, another a mechanism take by, by bacteria. And as as you know already, resistance to antibiotics is one of the most severe problems in modern medicine. You just heard about it, and. We try to find out how does it happen. So there was a study on, on healthy people that are, have never seen or exposed to Western medicine or Western diet. They are living in the jungles of uh, Brazil. And uh, yet, although they didn't get any food or any treatment or any interaction, with Western medicine, they have already genes for antibiotic resistance. So we think that this finding shows that resistance to antibiotics is a basic problem, process for the survival of many microorganisms, not only these ones in, in the jungles. And this is regardless of their exposure. It means if they are exposed more, they, there will be more, more resistance, but the, the um, principle of the resistance are, are not connected to life, sorry. So this only also suggests that microbes have long evolved the capacity to fight toxins. For them, antibiotics are toxins. So to fight antibiotics. And that, that preventing drug resistance may be harder than scientific think, scientists think. And I think it's correct. It's harder than it was believed in the beginning. So the increasing appearance of multi-drug resistant strains together with the minimal, actually negligible number of new antibiotic drugs that are presently undergoing development by companies is becoming a colossal problem. Thus, it seems that we will soon revert back to the pre-antibiotic era during which diseases caused by parasites or by simple or severe infections like tuberculosis, they are almost untreatable. Or we are reaching a post-antibiotic era, as called by the World Health Organization, it was a, a, earlier mentioned by the chair. And consequently, the World Bank estimated that up to 3.8% of the global economy will be lost by 2050 because of resistance. Actually, the number 3.8 is the last uh, established ones, but between them, they are also talking, already talking about 4.5%. Yet, very few new antibiotics are in development. Most of the dr large drug companies, I mentioned it earlier, but I want to uh, repeat it, have stopped attempt to, at creating new antibiotics owing to the huge mismatch between the social value and the production of new ones. They just stopped, you want to see? On the left side, you see the uh, growth of 
pre-resistance bacteria between 1990 and 2002, just 12 years. So there are here three, three uh, pathogens. And on the right side, you see, you look at from 84 to 214, which is 30 years, and this is the number of new antibiotics reaching almost zero. What do, the, what do the pharma companies do? They improve the natural antibiotic properties, like make all these uh, changes on the natural antibiotics. We are also doing it, but in a different way. Uh, you can see here six different new macrolides, newly made macrolides together with Dr. Sherman in uh, Michigan. Uh, the the uh, green arrow shows how protein the, the, uh, moves within the tunnel. And these are the new antibiotics. Each of them disturbs in a different way. And I really don't want to go into detail. That it's possible to do it. Yet, it's a good, it's a good way, but not the only way, by no means. The question actually is, can we combat, can human beings combat resistance to antibiotics? I think that it's unlikely because bacteria want to live, if you ask them, and because bacteria are cleverer than us, much cleverer than us. Yet we decided to contribute towards controlling or even combating antibiotic resistance in, in a different way. So until recently, almost all available crystal structures of ribosomes were of pathogens model, of not real pathogens, just of their models, because nobody wanted to work with pathogens. These are found suitable to illuminate common modes of antibiotic action, but they didn't explain the specificity. And I thought it's a lost piece of important knowledge. So our con concept for fighting or controlling, or controlling bacteria as visto is identifying pathogen specific essential structural motifs. And we think that each, in each pathogen or in each pathogen family, we can find some. So we, uh, crystallized ribosomes from pathogens and compare them to the normal ones, E. coli or so. First of all, we, there is a general lesson. All bacterial ribosomes are really similar, but they are not exact. Second, it's possible to increase antibiotic effectivity. It's possible to make more potent antibiotics. I want to show you an example. What you see here is erythromycin in, in red in the, in the binding pocket in the tunnel in Cyan. And the, the structure, main chain of pathogenic and non-pathogenic new bacteria. So the, the non-pathogenic is the gray, and the yellow, and the pathogenic is the the blue and the and the um, purple. So it, actually, they are the same until here. But this part is missing in the pathogenic. So why not to use it to make a, a new antibiotic or a, a longer antibiotic? So this is an idea how antibiotics can be modified and improved by, by structures. I will, I will uh, skip lessons two and three and go to four because this is beyond expectation. It really made me uh, excited. And it talks about producing of novel antibiotics, nothing that, that exists now. So if we look at, at this uh, structure, the gray is the structure of a non-pathogenic ribosome. 
in the editions of blue, ocean, are editions that are on the pathogenic. The rest is the same. So there are some editions you can see here. And here, and here, and here. There are some editions on the, on the, of the non-pathogen on the pathogen. So if we look at it more carefully, like we focus on this one, the non-pathogen and pathogen are the same everywhere except for the, the extension here that is only in the pathogenic. So this part, in our, in our uh, opinion, can be a potential binding site to new antibiotics. So we looked all over and there are many potential binding sites for this particular, this Staphylococcus aureus and uh, uh, the um, possibilities of, of binding new antibiotics. So far, so far we identified 25 new potential sites like the site I just showed you for design of advanced antibiotics and 16 of them we, we bound to each alone. So 16 of them were found to inhibit protein biosynthesis. And because there is no, no, no known uh, function of ribosome on it, on it uh, it, so far, bacteria did not assign vital roles for this site. They are important for later on in the cell, but bacteria doesn't think it's important. So we can, we can uh, use them and we can exploit them for design of advanced degradable antibiotics. I'll talk about degradable uh, in a minute, but it's clear that they are in, in environmental friendly. So what do we do? We look at the sequences of uh, uh, antibiotics, all types of, uh, sorry, of ribosomes for many, for many uh, uh, sources. And we look what is different between them and, and the other bacteria. And we try to focus like, for instance, on this one. And what do we do on this one? So let's just take an example. We are now looking at the structure of the ribosome. With here, there is a part that is not uh, used, used by the two, by the two uh, ribosomes, by the two bacteria. Everything else, you see it's much thicker. It's, uh, it's, it's the same, it's, it's a, um, Concern. But this one between T55 and A81 on the side is specific to the, to the pathogen. So this is a potential new species specific target. Like I showed you earlier, the armor, all this inside. And actually, if you want to see some examples, they are shown here. All these pieces are, all these RNA pieces are specific to Staphylococcus. And if you want to see them a little bit larger, I really love to see these pictures. We can uh, use, try to use them. You can even see, if, if you can see here, the blue piece is the way from one side to another side that, be, that does not appear in other, in other bacteria. So we made, we made the antisense target to some of this, uh, of this uh, um, sorry, antisense that target some of these regions, we even looked at more, and we selected from them those that uh, reduce the IC50 uh, uh, dramatically, as possible antibiotics, you see the ratio IT50 of one or two, which, uh, which are uh, even better than the commercial ones. How do we do this? So we do antisense, as I said earlier, but not all the, all the available parts are uh, 
יוני שיין RNA, צא מוקדם R, דאבל שיין או פילט לייק דיט או דט, צא דה R נאו, ניו טרגטינג, דט אר בייסט און כמסטרי נוט אאורס און דה ליטרצ'ר, דט אלוז טריפלקס אין סאון, סו וי אולסו מייק טריפלקס. We also look at, at other bacteria, other, uh, I call it uh, bad bacteria. <laughs> And you, you can see here tuberculosis. It has on the, on the gray here, on the green here, it has a piece that does not, does not exist in any other bacteria. So we can target it like that and that. Or we can target this side of it. You can see it from the side here. So we are doing this too. We are taking advantage of motions that are functionally important that we discovered by our antisense methods. And we can disturb this motion. You can see it here, the exiting of the tRNA. So we can uh, adjust, uh, adjust the molecule that binds there. And even in uh, an MTB, we can target. I think I have the whole structure, no? Sorry. So we, we have the whole structure. Yeah, I just showed it. Yeah, it's the the structure of MTB, tuberculosis, and it, it just moves a bit. So this is the way we target these pieces of it, or this piece. Also, we are looking at the recently acquired resistance. It means of patients, patients that acquired resistance that it is not known or not exactly known. So we are looking at that. I really cannot go into detail. And also we are looking for predicted target sites. So you can see here uh, three bacteria. The gray is E. coli for uh, easiness. And all these are uh, specific to each of them. Uh, We are also looking at the more, more aggressive pathogens, like multidrug pathogens. We think that it doesn't matter how many drugs it, uh, it, it is resistant to, if we can stop the binding of the drug to the, to the ribosome. We also look at parasites. So this is Lishmania. And this was the first one we did, so we were so excited that the structure is good, that we went protein by protein in the whole structure together and even, even looked for modification. But for antibiotics work, the, uh, the, we already have one that uh, stops this mania. Uh, we also look at differences between parasites and between human ribosome and between E. coli. For instance, here, the Ardia, which is a very important in the United States, very troublemaking in the United States. And we actually already suggest several uh, targets here that can work. And we can now go back we, to, to our, our lessons. So I stopped at lesson four when I said that it's uh, I, actually unbelievable to me. I didn't expect it. That the num number five, it's a, a more, more a traditional. It's a, about selectivity and similarity. So you all know about, you all know about the microbiome, which is harmless bacteria residing in the flora of semi-exposed mammalian organs. And most of them are extremely useful and they, are, they belong to your bacteria. So actually when we take an antibiotics, 
we can, we can also harm them. And we really don't want to do this. Uh, with the normal antibiotics, we hardly can avoid harming them. Then in selectivity, there are two levels, pathogens versus new bacteria of the, my of the microbiome. That's really important, as I say and bacteria versus eukaryotes. So about the microbiome, since it is a normal, normal bacteria, normal new bacteria, I think we, we the, the world will have to use specific antibiotics to non-new bacteria. For bacteria versus the eukaryotes, here it's much easier because if you look here, in the, in the gray are the prokaryotes, and in the red, blue, and green, it doesn't matter what you look at, are the additions of the, in the, uh, in, in higher, higher animals, in human, for instance. So this shows that almost everything we want to do on the periphery, which is the position of our new antibiotics, is not going to harm the patient's ribosomes. So lesson six is about environmental and ecological. And here, of most of the ribosomal antibiotics that are useful today are extensions of small organic molecules. You can see here several examples down there that those cannot be digested by eukaryotes and cannot be degradable in the environment. It means even if we minimize the use, the use of antibiotics, they will, they will be disturbing the environment. We, for on the, the other side, we, we, can, we can control our, our uh, antibiotics. They can, we can optimize them in terms of chemical properties and in, in terms of, of uh, action. So far, we used only nucleic acid or oligopeptides. So in summary, the new insights obtained from these high resolution structures of the ribosome from genuine pathogens provide unique chemical tools for suggesting novel sites for potential future antibiotics, hence reducing the, ch the chances of resistance for suggesting how to improve the clinical performance of non-antibiotic and for better distinction between pathogens and others. So we talk about pathogen-specific antibiotics. It means the design of antibiotics drugs specific for each and every pathogen, in contrast to the current preference of global. We are aware of the problematic economical issues associated with pathogen-specific antibiotics. Companies don't want to make it uh, non-specific. Nevertheless, we expect that the pharma companies will consider it. And for the efficient use, of pathogen-specific antibiotics, which means swift identification of the type of the relevant pathogen. And steps towards this aim are already in progress by several medical companies. So our structures, oh sorry, our structure-based specific-specific design is aimed at minimizing. We have to remember this. We are not going to uh, get rid of, of resistance, but minimizing widespread resistance, minimize microbiome destruction, and minimize environmental problems. Before I finish, I want to um, thank the Weizmann Institute, they let me work, and the committee that approved it. I also want to uh, thank very, very much the 
Max Planck Institute, specifically the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin, that was headed by Professor Whitman. And his dream was to see the structure of the ribosome. So he provided a lot of clinical support and encouraged us through the very difficult time and set up for us or help setting up for us, establishing for us a structure, structure unit in Daisy, Hamburg, where I was working for 24 years. I want also to thank my research group in Hamburg that stopped in 2004 and at the Weizmann that goes on for their determination and devotion in good and bad times. You can see here the group in the Hamburg group that say that the, the uh, technicians that work on the crystallization of ribosomes are angels that they are very excited with the first synchrotron came. Here we all go, we filled up a whole aeroplane to go to Cornell, it's a small aeroplane, but still. And here they came to Israel to look for the bacteria in the Dead Sea, which gave the first ribosomes that crystallized. This is the group in Israel. I, I cannot talk about everybody, but I want to show you Anat Bashan, Dr. Anat Bashan, who is running the group, who is the real head of the group for a lot of time, since he was a student actually. And let's uh, uh, focus on Tamar. Tamar came to us 19 years ago for 10 weeks, and she's still, she's still there. And she had a birthday that day, and she baked a cake. You see the cake? Here is the cake. And this shows that for us ribosomes are sweet. I also want to thank my family, my daughter and my granddaughter, that uh, were supportive all the time. Here, my granddaughter gave a, a speech that I didn't know about. As you know, she it means me is a very busy scientist but she always find time for me. I have always admired her work. And because of that, I invited her at the age of five to my kindergarten. So I talked about ribosomes in the kindergarten. I also want to show you, this is my medal that was mentioned earlier, Nobel medal. It's important, but more important, sorry. But more important, is the thank you card that I got from my granddaughter that called me the grandma of the year. The grandma of the year is Adayona. And this is hanged on the wall. And when I asked her which year everybody, uh, every price has a year, she said, you have to re-price yourself. You have to react well. If not, I'll take it off the wall. So it's there already for almost 20 years. She didn't take it on, off the wall to see it hanged. I want to show you that uh, some Israelis are celebrating the ribosome in a, a, a masquerade. And uh, Michel Kiske, Grumi, as head of full of ribosomes, you see the small tribune, the large. A small, very large, a small, very symmetrical. He thinks that antibiotics should be here, here, and here. But he is not a scientist. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ada. It uh, was a fantastic trip. I mean, through your uh, huge uh, scientific success. But what I'm very happy with is that you decided at a certain point of time not to stay in the, in the basic science only, but also to move to the applied science. And, and I think uh, it was a very great move and it will be very helpful to all the humanity, I believe. Thank so you. thank you very much for doing this step.
uh, I think it's critical one. Once I'll tell you a story about what happened for me when I did a shift and gave a seminar in Germany, what they did to me, but uh, that's another story. I think uh, it's, it's really fascinating the direction of the world. You have, you have actually uh, a bad news and good news. The bad news are that resistance here to stay. The good news is that we have to be very tricky and try to find a way to override it. And when, when we block something to get another way to override it, but you, you brought it to a, to a kind of a molecular level and that's really uh, a much better chance than just trial and error. So thank you very much. Thank you. I, I would let two questions only, and then we leave the rest for the for the end for the. Okay, so we accept two questions. Can I ask something, Hazi? Yes, please. Okay, thank you, Ada. It was a great presentation. Uh, you mentioned the pathogen-specific antibiotics. That's very important, of course, for sure. But when you want to prevent infection, not only to treat infection, you may need something that will be much more general. Are you thinking or aware about something that would be wide enough in order to use uh, for prevention activities that would be wiser than what we have today? I would love to, but I also know that preventing by chemical or, or genetic way can be, or, or biological way, can be this, at the end also bad for the patient to, to prevent. If we can prevent fully, I'm all for it. But so far, what, what I know about is preventation is not always a, um, I don't want to be not successful, but not always, uh, Friendly. Thank okay. you. Okay, the second question, if there is one. Okay, I think we'll have many more questions to add, at least I have, but I think we'll keep it for the end. And I think I'm very happy to present our second speaker. You know, I was uh, very easy going on Ada because she really, because she uh, is our guest of honor and I gave her all the time she needed, but I'm going to be very tough and restricted with all other, with all other uh, speakers. So be, be aware. I, I'm not, I don't believe in fairness in science, you know. I'm fairness in, in, in the sense I believe very much in fairness, but not, I don't think everyone deserves to get the same. I, I left, let's leave the, socialist approach for other things, not for science. Uh, I'd like uh, to, to really, uh, <clears throat> we have our second speakers and uh, the second speaker is, is Valerie Gigante. And no, Ralph, sorry, Ralph, Ralph uh, Stubrak. And uh, he is very important because he represents the, the the people that really should be highly concerned about all this resistance, all the regulatory people, the people deal with uh, public health and all this. And he's a senior scientist, uh, program officer uh, at, at the global AMR R&D hub in Berlin. And the main goal of this hub is to promote high level uh, coordination among governments and upstream uh, funders from different world regions in order to better align national and international R&D efforts to fight against the AMR. Ralph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Professor Bahn, all, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. I try to share my screen. Okay, 
Um, uh, I was also very pleased when Bert Löffler asked me to help setting up this session on AMR. And I'm really delighted to present my work, work on this uh, important conference now. So as you know, AMR is uh, a major global challenge representing an ever increasing threat to human, to animal and to environmental health. And an, um, um, and ever present a um, growing social economic burden. A recent study published in Lancet earlier this year um, estimated that in 2019, more than 1 million people around the world died from infections linked to microbes resistance to antibiotics. This means that AMR is a very deadly disease. Um, what this study also showed shows is that the disease burden is not equally distributed regionally, but the burden is highest in low and middle income countries with reported rates of deaths attributable to resistance highest in Western Africa, followed by Eastern Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, it is important to mention that without functioning antibiotics, we will face a crisis in medicine because without anti antibiotics, Routine surgeries like cardiac bypass, hip replacements, cesarean sections, but also cancer chemotherapy and organ transplantations are not possible anymore, at least uh, the way we do it now. Therefore, we should not compare AMR against other diseases, but uh, recognize and value antibiotics as the foundation of modern medicine. And uh, here comes the global AMR R&D hub into play. The global R&D uh, AMR R&D Hub was established following a call from the G20 leaders for a new international R&D collaboration hub to maximize the impact of existing and new antimicrobial basic and clinical research initiatives, as well as initiatives on product development. We aim to improve and enhance R&D activities and policies across the One Health spectrum. We are steered by um, a board of members consisting of uh, 17 countries, most of them from the uh, G20, but not all, uh, by the European Commission and the two foundations, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, the, the Wellcome Trust. In addition, we, we have on our boards the tripartite uh, organization that as observers, as is the FAO, the OIE, the WHO, and the OACD. Our work is aligned across three strategic pillars. So the one is guide and support evidence-based decision-making, enhance collaboration and coordination. And pillar three is promote awareness, knowledge, and visibility on uh, the highest political levels. Um, we, we also are advised by a stakeholder group, and I only wanted to mention it because we have later on in this session presentations by Ursula Teutzbacher from uh, representing ESTMIT, and also from Kevin Outerson representing uh, CARPX. Um, it is clear that AMR is a global issue, but the good thing is that it's being recognized at the highest political level, and that the so-called silent pandemic is not silent anymore. Um, we are seeing actions and commitments at the level of the European, of the European Union, but also uh, on the level of the G7 in the recent years to seriously tackle the challenges uh, of AMR. For example, AMR featured heavily on the agenda of the UK uh, presidency, uh, G7 presidency last year, culminating in a publication of a statement that shows an agreement between member states to strengthen action on AMR. In fact, we at the Global AMR and DHUB together with the WHO have been called up and to prepare a progress report on activities towards drug development. And this report will be delivered to the health and finance ministers uh, actually this month. Um, this year, Germany holds the G7 presidency and there has been renewed commitment to address the AMR uh, and AMR is among the three key health priorities for the German um, G7 presidency next to uh, the Corona uh, virus pandemic and um, climate change and health. At the European Union level, France holds the presidency, presidency of the Council of the European Commission in the first half of this year. And um, uh, France is also com committed to the topic of AMR uh, as 
as well. Um, one of our um, key activities over the last three years uh, was the establishment and generation of this uh, dynamic dashboard, which represents a global knowledge center for AMR and D. Information is uh, presented in, th in three galleries. The first gallery is the investment gallery where we collect and uh, display information on funding globally. So we uh, display information on over 12,000 projects uh, funded by 218 funders uh, worldwide in all one health sectors. That means animal, human, plants, and uh, environment. In addition, we have the clinical pipeline gallery, which collates um, information from the Pew Charitable, Sh Charitable Trust and the WHO on Q and clinical products in development targeting priority pathogens. Um, overall, it shows that the pipeline is insufficient and more action is needed to fill the pipeline. And you will uh, hear much more details about this in the next uh, presentation by Valeria G Gigante, who speaks next in this session. And last but not least, uh, the third uh, gallery is uh, the incentives gallery, which provides information on what initiatives are doing to fix the challenges of development and accessing priority antibacterials for human health. Um, here you can uh, see a snapshot of, the, uh, of, of our investment gallery. This is the interface you see when you enter from our um, uh, website and uh, on the left hand side, you can see that we have different reports uh, and uh, we have reports uh, which combine all sectors, but also uh, sector specific reports. You can see uh, so in which area the funding is going, uh, in which regions the funding is going or where are the research organizations sitting. Um, you see uh, the investment over time and in which uh, infectious agents and that investment is go going. And once a year, we will publish uh, an annual report analyzing all the data with it, within our uh, dashboard. Um, and um, this is meanwhile very well uh, received and recognized by major organizations. Uh, so our data are referenced by GARD P, by, uh, by, by, the, global, by the Global Leaders Group. Um, by the Beam Alliance, but also by many other organizations, including also the F F Financial Times as you are using our data. And this is only uh, to show, show we are, uh, based on our data, uh, which we are collecting, we are also doing some collaborations. And I want to mention only the, the one collaboration with Futures Leaders against AMR, because uh, Anna uh, Govet is later on presenting this organization and another uh, collaboration we have with EU Gemre and Christine Adal will speak about our collaboration on incentivizing antibiotics access and innovation. In addition to uh, the annual report we publishing once a year, we, we are publishing specific reports on specific aspects uh, of our data including uh, a report on development of veterinary vaccines to reduce antibiotic use in animal health. Uh, and um, also another report on animal health, AMR and the landscape in low and middle income countries to mention only two. All these reports are available uh, uh, from our website. Um, Going back to the investment gallery of our dashboard, but what we can see really is that there is a, a stable funding uh, from public and philanthropic organizations or funders, which uh, is in the area of, uh, let's say, $1.8 billion annually. Um, 40% of this uh, investment goes to what we call product-related um, research, uh, product related research is research towards therapeutics, diagnostics, or vaccines. Yeah, and, yeah. and we can see that uh, the yeah. focus is on therapeutics, um, which got three times more uh, investment than diagnostic yeah. and vaccines. And we see here, here a kind of gap. Interestingly, the same number is really coming from the, the private sector, that uh, also the private sector is uh, investing around 1.8 billion euros annually, uh, dollars annually. And this are not our data, but that's other data from the AMR Industry Alliance. And that's matched very well with the public and philanthropic funding. So 
I think, and these numbers are underestimated because the AMR Industry Alliance only counts uh, the investment into research from this from their, their 53 members. And also our uh, investment from the uh, public and philanthropic funders are probably underestimated because we missed some countries, we missed some funders, and we missed uh, also some grants. So we expect that, or we guess that the investment is uh, on both sides probably uh, over $2 billion uh, a year. And we see also um, initiatives such as the AMR Action Fund, which now um, well, which signal a commitment by the pharmaceutical sector, but even with the substantial proposed investment of $1 billion, um, uh, plus further public and philanthropic support, only two to four antibiotics are expected to reach the market, market by 2030. That is the number is likely insufficient to mitigate the growing MR challenge we are facing globally. And the, uh, the first uh, two uh, drugs were funded by the AMR Action Fund just uh, uh, last month. Um, I only want to quick, uh, so in addition, we have one of our galleries is a gallery of in incentives and um, in, which we, in which we display uh, in an interactive, interactive format incentives being implemented that aim to improve the functioning of markets and the broader R&D ecosystem responsible for the development and distribution of therapeutics for the treatment of priority human bacterial infections. Currently, we see interesting targeted initiatives to improve efficiencies and address some of the challenges among the value chain, but the collective scale and economic impetus likely still remains too weak. So the, uh, the UK has, has a nice uh, subscription model, uh, which is not a model anymore, but, but is now really active and the first uh, um, evaluation of the first two drugs were uh, done uh, last month. Mm. Um, our, so I do not want to say too much about this incentivizing development and access to priority antibiotics, but uh, I only wanted to mention that we um, con constructed some uh, st study studies that are available on our website, but the key, um, our key take home messages out of all three uh, studies is that there is an astonish astonishing mismatch between global needs and commercial potential. By highlighting this, we hope this study will help mobilize the required action to both support innovation and ensure that these necessary new products are accessible to those with the greatest needs around the world. In combination, these studies were used to derive our recommendations to the G7 and G20 for their ongoing reflection. And you will uh, hear uh, yeah, in two other presentations more about the, uh, the incentive topics, the presentations by Christina Dahl and uh, Kevin Outerson. And uh, on a given occasion, I also want, would like to introduce uh, our interview series, AML Snapshots where a, a quick but deep dive into the key challenges we are facing in AMR. Experts are invited to share their perspectives and vision for the way forward in the field. Um, we have interviewed the first three experts, Sabine Vogler from the Aust Austrian Institute of Public Health, John Rex uh, from AMR Solutions, and El Elizabeth Erlanger Findel from the OIE. And just we finished today the interview with uh, um, Dem Sally Davis, which will be published on our uh, website and also on YouTube as soon as we have proceeded this um, this, uh, this material. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your uh, attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, Ralph. This was great. You have 50 seconds left. So. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, you, you. You gave us this presence, 50 seconds. So okay. I, I, I left the first comment, then we'll open it for questions. And, you know, it, all the numbers you bring uh, sound that uh, not much can be done. You know, we know how much it costs to develop one drug today. And if you said 1 billion, 2 billion, maybe you can develop two or three drugs at most. 
with this money going to up to the to the to really going through all the steps of the phase one, two, three, and all the rest of the preclinical and so on. So it's not very encouraging, I have to say. And and uh, I think we have to find a way to shake the world in a in a much stronger way. Uh, otherwise, we, we really have problems. As, as I said, as we say with the climate, everyone talks, but nothing is done really seriously. And if we if we mix the two disasters together, it will be tough luck to, to our grandchildren and the next generation to come. It's really frightening, I have to say. Okay. Now we open for questions. Any question? It seems you were very clear about what you are doing is very important. And I'm sure it will be question at the end where everyone come together because then we see all, all the other people that are dealing with similar aspect like yours. So I think we'll move to the to the next uh, to the next speaker. And and this is Valerie Gigante. And uh, Valerie uh, is, a, is a team leader in, in uh, <clears throat> one health research priority setting uh, and synergy. Uh, she's a team lead at the, at the WHO, which is, you know, really the, the one that is the most concerned and really see the problems in, in the way everyone else should see it. Uh, and she's in the AMR division, and that's what we are looking for, actually. actually. So, uh, Valerie, you have the stage. I think the topic of your lectures is uh, comforting AMR beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. All is yours. Thank you, Chesi. Thank you for, uh, for the floor. Yes, I'm team lead in uh, the AMR division and I'm responsible for coordinating research and priority setting. Today, my presentation will cover the burden of AMR and the WHO efforts to support research and development, but also the consequences of the failure to support innovation. And I will close with fighting AMR with nanomedicine. The global burden of AMR has been established with 1.27 million deaths directly attributable to bacterial AMR and with 4.9 million deaths associated with bacterial AMR. These numbers uh, could be even lower when the true burden of AMR. And unfortunately, AMR hit harder in low and middle income countries where poor people have little or no access at all to second line uh, drugs. However, the good news is that from being an unrecognized and hidden pro problem, a clear picture is coming regarding the true burden of AMR. Let's see what are the key elements contributing to the emergence and spread of uh, antimicrobial resistance. So stewardship, first of all, some countries still present inadequate stewardship and monitor practices. Resistance, and we have seen something already, the poor stewardship has reduced the average time to the emergence of resistance. Innovation, the antibacterial pipeline is far behind the global needs today. Access and funding, commercialization of new antibacterial is lengthy, even in a high income setting, and is unsustainable and generates a negative return of investment. And shortages. Shortages is a serious issue both in high income countries and low income countries. As the producers are only a small number and they are concentrated in some regions of the world. Uh, as anticipated, the resistance is the crucial problem for us. And if we see antibiotics commercialized between 1930 and 1950, the average time for resistance to emerge was 11 years. For antibiotics launched between 1970s and 2000, it was only two, between two and three years. WHO has developed uh, and maintains tools available for researchers, pharmaceutical companies, and policymakers. And these are the tools that are developed by my team and my unit. 
Um, we have two, the two priority pathogen lists. The bacterial priority pathogen list will be released uh, by the end of this year, beginning of 2024. And the first fungal priority pathogen list, this product is ready and we will be published in the next month. We're finalizing the report. We also have three pipeline analysis, target product profiles for treatment and diagnostics. We support R&D through partnership. And we also contribute to the global um, dialogue on financial incentives. And we have in these uh, fields also the secure and the shortage project. As anticipated, we have three, uh, anti um, three uh, pipeline analysis, the antibacterials one, the antifungal, and the vaccine. If we look at the, um, this is uh, a preview of the uh, of our um, findings, of our results. We have tw only 27 products um, in phase one, three against the bacterial um, identified bacterial priority pathogens. Only six of these 27 products, uh, we can consider them as innovative. And only two of the six are against uh, are active against critical uh, gram negative. This is a big problem because a pipeline to, to be robust, to be uh, sufficient against these priority pathogens should contain a differentiated set of tools of antibiotics against the identified priorities. And at the moment, we don't have. Let's see what are the consequences of the failure to support innovation. This is a slide from the PCG report that was published earlier this, this year. So antibiotics share the same risk, cost, and failure with other therapeutics area. However, they show a negative return of investment. And if we look at the uh, right-hand side, we can see that the the total cost for R&D commercialization is approximately 1 billion, while the estimated cumulative revenues is almost the alpha. This means that the market is unsustainable. Large pharma companies have already exited the scene, and the market is, uh, the R&D space is dominated by small micro uh, biotech. It means supports finding guidance to uh, bring to the market and to maintain on the market their products. Let's see uh, how nanomedicine could, could support uh, us in our um, fight against uh, multidrug resistance bacteria. So the R&D of antibiotics is challenged by several factors. It's difficult to, uh, to find a new molecular target and we saw with the um, in this uh, panel uh, that there might be some new um, target. However, it's really um, challenging to, uh, to hit them. There are challenges also around discovering new, new uh, antibiotics belonging to a new class with new mechanism of action. Because the ultimate goal is to find uh, new products that don't show cross resistance with existing um, agents. There are also um, clinical challenges with antibiotics uh, related to, for instance, the, the clinical use blood markers that are the C-reactive protein or the procrel cytomine. They are related mostly to the acute infection phase and they lack specificity. Also, the diagnostics um, unfortunately present long turnaround times that is not acceptable, for instance, when dealing with sepsis, where every hour count to save a patient's life. There are challenges related to the efficacy of this product due to the inefficient drug penetration in the cell surface and in the biofield. There are increasing resistance, the drug decomposition by beta-lactamase, for instance, the efflux pump, or the bacterial walls that become thicker and thicker. So all these challenges constitute a barrier to the effective therapies and to antibiotic stewardship. Nano, uh, nanomedicines usually are used, or have been most been applied for uh, in the oncology fields. However, they could support the uh, fight to AMR um, for both diagnostics and therapeutic purposes, owing to their tunable properties and to the great capacity for surface 
functionalization. They can be used as drug delivery system. An example is the liposomes um, that can offer a PKPD improvement, enhancing, for instance, antibiotic stability, uptake, and the bioavailability at the site of action. But you know, uh, particles are also uh, used as direct uh, for their direct antimicrobial activity or synergistic activity when loaded with antibiotics. An example are the antimicrobial peptides, oligonucleotides, nano antibiotics, phage therapies, natural compounds, some applications like the antimicrobial photodynamic therapy, the smart materials. And the opportunities are uh, for efficacy and safety improvement, allowing precise tar targeting or a greater payload with antibiotics that should be able in this way to penetrate cell surfaces cell uh, surface in the biofilm eventually for gram negatives. Drug resistance uh, seems to be um, less than a problem with nanotechnology. So they should be able to elicit um, a less pressure on bacteria to become resistant. And surely they offer a great versatility in, in the approaches pursued. For instance, um, the magnetic drug extraction methods or the uh, well-known engineering. Pages. Let's see some uh, example of the uh, approach pursued uh, in this space with uh, uh, nano in nanomedicines. So we have out, like in for authorized compound we have the liposomal amphotericin that is um, available from FDA since 1995, available for um, severe fungal infection. The liposomal um, Amicacin, authorized uh, by EMI in 2020 for um, uh, Mycobacterium avium complex, even though this is not, uh, not included in the bacterial operative pathogen list. In clinical uh, phase, so under development, we have um, a number of bacteriophages. They are included in the non traditional uh, section of our antibacterial pipeline, and they constitute 27% of the non traditional approaches. Uh, also, one interesting compound applying in nanotechnologies is the CalO2. It's an antitoxin agent that um, possesses some uh, docking site able to bind the bacterial toxins. Um, some other applications are in diagnostics, like magnetic, gold, fluorescent, lipid based nanoparticles, but also um, in medical device uh, because the nanomaterials are used as a coating system for. Um, uh, medical device, um, and they provide a new approach of the biofilm uh, formation, so it's really uh, important. And to conclude, um, challenges and next steps. So nanoparticles hold a great potential, uh, and I believe that this potential still needs to be unlocked. Um, the activity, mechanism of action, and efficacy needs to be appropriately demonstrate uh, in the appropriate uh, development program. If it's a clinical, uh, or a therapeutics, or um, the appropriate program for, for device, for instance. Nanopharmaceutical r and is challenged by uh, many factors. And just to mention some, stability, safety, biocompatibility, uh, intellectual property, formulation design, administration route, lower regulation, scalability, quality control, and not ultimately cost uh, for development compared to uh, the traditional and non-traditional antibiotics. And the good news is that the FDA released in April last month, so a couple of weeks ago, uh, a new guidance for uh, uh, biological products containing nanomaterials. Um, and with this, I would conclude my presentation, thanking the uh, organization of the Clover of the Summit, um, the, pa the, uh, the panelists, uh, and, my, and my team. Thank you so much. You're even better than uh, Ralph, because you finished two and a half minutes before your time. Actually, you gave a, a wonderful perspective on the field and also in the involvement and the potential of nanomedicine, which I think is one of the target of our meeting today is really to mix between the needs and the use of, of uh, 
of nano medicine, nano drugs, and so on. So that's very, very nice. And uh, I can tell you from my perspective a little bit, I'm in drug delivery for quite some time. I think since almost uh, 40 something years. And I can tell you that, you know, we, we're developing a drug that Tauva will talk about it um, later, but it's a liposomal uh, antibiotics. And I'm not going to go into details at all, but one thing I want to tell you that when I come to companies and actually major companies, and the scientists like the project very much. And then it comes to the business people and I present the antibiotics. They said, you know, if you bring a similar drug in cancer, we'll sign the agreement. But antibiotics, sorry about it. And I asked them why. They said, we have to spend about the same amount of money as in cancer, which is not correct. You have to spend much less, much less if you know how to do it. But they said the amount you can charge is very small. And at the end, the people get cured very fast. So, you know, with cancer, if, if someone lives five years and use these drugs, for every person, the company make millions or half a million or something. And for antibiotics, they will make only $10,000. So that's really anti-challenge, anti-motivation for them. And the question how we motivate the private sector to invest money in it. Government has a limited resources. How to really encourage the private sector to, in, to invest in these major, major issues that can really, can really be so bad for medicine in, in amount of few years and and for the economies of the country because you will have to pay for it so in the long you run them, you can tell the companies that they will make from one person in cancer a lot of money but in so time they will have thousands and ten thousands and hundred thousands of patients for less money Ada you know all the company prefer low volume, high cost, all of them. So they don't make don't have to make much and they charge a lot. We and with to, antibiotics, we, we talk about, about the opposite, high volume and low cost. And that's really a big, big difference. Yeah. You, you have to try to educate them. <laughs> okay. We are trying hard. Maybe with your help, we do better. You know how many times they fool me? Okay. Yeah, the economic okay. Again, dimension of this problem will surely be treated by the next presenter. I can tell you, yeah, that our role is to keep spreading awareness and engage patients and engage all healthcare professionals because actually it is a problem not only of infectious disease specialists, but really of every single doctor. So spreading awareness is uh, what we can do at the moment. Okay, thank you. And uh, questions for uh, for Valerie? So again, I'm sure it will be part of the discussion at the, at the later stage because all come together and it will be, a, I'm sure, very, very interesting discussion. So stay alarmed for it. And we are going to the next speaker, which is the Professor <coughs> Kevin Alterson. And uh, I think it's really in the same line uh, that we have. And, and uh, Kevin is a, is a professor of law at the Boston University and executive director of, of uh, Carb X, which is one of the main supporters of this issue of uh, bacterial resistance. And uh, it's an accelerator. We can argue with them the way to look at things. And we also, we leave it for the discussion. I don't want to introduce it here. His research work focused on problems with pharmaceutical markets, especially drugs that lose 
effectiveness over time due to resistance. And the topic of the lecture, of the presentation, will be uh, let's see estimating the, the appropriate size of global pool in incentive for antibacterial medicine. That's very important. Kevin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I confirm that you can see my slide? I see. Uh, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. And it's my disclaimer, I uh, represent my academic work today, not uh, CARVEX or any particular CARVEX funder. It's my academic work. Um, we've seen many with things from this. End? Can you can hear me? We, can we discuss CARVEX with you at the end? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Okay, fine. Um, we've seen other slides from this study, from the Lancet study, um, on the global burden of disease for drug-resistant bacteria. But just to make it clear, compared to other diseases for which we have a lot of mobilization and we have global institutions, uh, for example, the Global Fund for HIV, AIDS, uh, and malaria, and uh, you can see other diseases here as well. We need appropriate interventions uh, given the size of this um, mortality burden on the people around the world, especially people in low and middle income countries, and especially children under the age of five. But when we think about antibacterials, they have a lot of effect that it's hard for the market to really address. Uh, think about all these columns, and I'm not going to go through them, but just with cancer, you were talking about cancer a moment ago. Uh, the second leading cause of death for those people with cancer is actually infection. Uh, and so there's a lot of modern medicine and uh, a lot of what we do in the, in the 21st century uh, to help patients that really relies on a safety net of antibacterials or antibiotics. And we don't really know how to appropriately incentivize um, to make sure that they're available. Um, like the discussion that you just had uh, a moment ago. Uh, economists are looking at this problem. Um, they're thinking about the other values of antimicrobials uh, in addition to the value to the specific patient. And uh, here, the, the third one on this list, enablement, is really that blue slide that I showed you just a moment ago. It enables surgery. It enables uh, cesarean section. It enables hip and joint replacement. It enables cancer treatment or any other treatment that modifies uh, or hurts the immune system while the treatment is happening. Uh, but there's other values too. You know, we heard discussions earlier about it would be excellent if we had narrow spectrum um, units, single species uh, antibacterials. That's the spectrum value. And um, it's helpful to, to reduce the amount of uh, bacterial um, evolution. But uh, for the company, it just means lower volume. And so how do you adjust for that? The impact of not paying currently for any of these things on the left is that you know a great number of the companies that are bringing new antibiotics to market actually go either bankrupt or something close to that in the past decade, uh, which results in very little money for new antibiotics to come through the system. Um, we also have a difficulty even when they do reach FDA or EMA or, or JPMA or Canadian approval. Here's a paper that uh, is co-authored with Christine Ardahl, who presents later. And Christine, just in case you notice, uh, I added the, the Swiss data um, because it was provided to me by Switzerland. Um, but um, all the antibiotics approved in the last decade, uh, many of them are having difficulty being accessed, you know, commercially launched, even in these high-income countries, um, which tells you all you need to know about what the access must be like in other places of the world that don't have as much money. So the fruit of a decade of innovation is barely reaching the G7 um, and probably is not reaching uh, at all uh, many of the countries around the world. So there's an access problem, and there may also be a problem with the type of antibiotics that are making it to the market. So I think we're paying for the wrong thing. We're paying for individual pills. We're not thinking about the population level benefits. We're, we need to, it's easy for people to free ride. Why, why would a cancer company pay anything for the antibiotics which make the therapy possible? And we need to think of a different way to do this because 
all of these issues reduce antibiotic R&D below what is really optimal uh, for the planet. So let's rethink how we pay for antibiotics. That's a key part of my academic project for the past uh, 15 years, I guess. Let's pay for value, not for volume. And an example of that, which has been pioneered by, by England, is a subscription agreement, like the Netflix model is how it's called sometimes, in which a government guar is guaranteed the availability of a key antibiotic for a decade. Uh, the commercial risk to the company is greatly reduced because they're guaranteed some revenues from that country. Uh, you only pay for success. You know, the, the government isn't investing in things that may or may not turn out. They get to pick the winner, which England has picked two drugs out of those 18. And it's fully delinked, which means you're rewarding R&D from the company, but you're not giving them any incentive to try to oversell this antibiotic. The key challenges are you better choose wisely. Uh, if you choose poorly on which drugs you've done, you've set the wrong targets for R&D and, and you've wasted the, the money you're spending. You need to pay efficiently. And the article I'm going to describe now, the research article, is really focused on that pay efficiently sort of question. Um, this is just to say that subscription models can solve all the questions I've raised above on access, on, on innovation, as well as can make it better on stewardship. There's no incentive to overuse or to overmarket this drug. We can save it for a rainy day. The company still gets paid, and the drug will be available when we need it. So let's think about the paper. Here's the paper. It's published in Health Affairs um, in 2021 at the end of last year. And, and my bottom line estimate, and then we'll, we'll come through um, some of the data and methods and conclusions, is that if you want a subscription model, which is not just paying the company for the R&D, but also paying them for the actual product. It's prepaid uh, for a decade. Uh, the number, the baseline, you know, best estimate is 3.1 billion globally. Uh, the U.S. would be expected to take some large portion of this through the Pasteur Act, and then each wealthy country would be expected to pay its fair share of this amount as well. It's a range, um, and we'll talk about some of the data in the slides to come. So there are, is an existing literature, these five reports on the right, um, and Christine Ardall was involved in, in a couple of these, and, and I was involved in, in two of these as well. But, um, you know, these reports did have estimates that converged around a billion dollars, but there are differences between the estimate I'm making now and these estimates. Uh, the first is that partially delinked, um, you know, if, if the company is still going to make money by selling the product, then the dollar amount that's necessary to reward them is lower. And all of these estimates on the right fall into that category of being partially delinked. A fully delinked or a subscription model costs more because you're not just paying for the historical R&D, you're also paying for the drug for the future. Most of them assumed increased push incentives. They dramatically understated uh, the, the chemistry and manufacturing cost as well as the post-approval cost of keeping the plant up. Uh, the peak year sales were, were, were too high, given the trends that we've had in the past decades. And uh, the, the figures obviously have to be adjusted to inflation to the present. And when you make these adjustments, you close almost all the gap between the former literature and my estimate of 3.1 for a subscription. Talk about the method and the data. The, the methods are expected net present value model, which has been commonly used in, in many of the prior studies. Um, there's multiple things that I looked at here, but I'm focusing today just on the subscription side. All of the data that goes into such a model is from the published literature. It's all described in excruciating detail in the supplemental appendix to the article. And there's also sensitivity estimates because we have to think about the upper and lower bounds. The 3.1 billion was the point estimate, uh, but remember that there were uh, higher and lower boundary sensitivity around that number. Um, everything that was done uh, was designed to mimic what a drug company would do. I started with an Excel model that Pfizer uses, and it's similar to what many other drug companies use. Uh, but I executed the changes in the model based on my goals, not, not Pfizer's goals. But it's designed to be something that companies would recognize and something that they actually utilize. Uh, all of the data behind it is, is publicly, transparently available, as is the model itself, the Excel file itself is in the Boston University uh, re repository. 
My goal in making it completely transparent, uh, including the dashboard, is so that other researchers can say, well, you know, Kevin assumed this about cost or, or this about, you know, the length of time it will take or the percentage chances of a project progressing. Uh, what if I changed that assumption? How would it change the outcome? And the dashboard allows anyone in the world really to do exactly that and um, to, to do their own sensitivity testing and to challenge the assumptions and the data that were made. So I'll give one example on costs. And so these are some of the sources of, of data on cost. How much money does it cost to bring an antibiotic to market? And these are the out-of-pocket costs, so not adjusted for the risk of failure or anything. And you can see the data. These have been adjusted for inflation. Uh, several of them you know, don't go deep enough into the preclinical, or they don't include CMC cost, or they don't include out of, you know, post-approval cost. And so making those adjustments, you can see uh, the total range of out-of-pocket cost in millions from a low of 405 million to a, a high of 554. The estimate that I used is the best estimate here was 428 uh, from Circaya. Now keep those amounts in, in your mind. And these are just the costs. You have to remember they also pay for the failures and, and also the return on capital. Um, on this next slide, these are five companies that are public, or at least were at the time. And, uh, and this is the cost that that it was required for them to bring one drug actually to FDA approval. And so accumulated deficit in their, in their FDA, in, in their Securities and Exchange Commission filings, and then the grants that they received that don't count against that, you can get a sense of what it cost these five companies to bring a single antibiotic to market. Now, just to say that for these costs are higher than what I showed on the previous page, but you should also acknowledge that um, for several of these companies, there were some uh, failures along the way, things that didn't work out. And so these costs are a little bit higher, but still it gives an independent verification or validation uh, that these costs are within the realm of reasonable. It's going to cost four or $500 million or more of out-of-pocket costs, unadjusted for failure, unadjusted for cost of capital, and to bring a new antibacterial from head to lead uh, to FDA approval. So the results, I've already highlighted this, but for reasons I described in the paper, what I, the, of the models that I present, the, the subscription model over a decade, uh, followed by an acquisition by a larger company is the best estimate. And, uh, and these show that, uh, that the numbers are significant, all of these numbers. It's, it's a billion, multiple billion dollars sort of number we're talking about for a global incentive. If we did that, though, it would allow all this excellent science that's being done uh, to actually result in, in a fair market. And uh, companies would no longer ignore your phone calls uh, when you have an amazing uh, scientific uh, project to present, but would be able to, to take it and to, and to move forward. A couple things to consider. Um, all of that data on cost, all the data on the chance of progression, how many projects fail along the way, all of that is what we've done in the past couple decades, which has largely been extensions on known classes. If what we really want are entirely novel things, things that forge resistance won't develop as quickly or new classes or non-traditionals like what we just heard from the WHO, those things are probably going to be costlier and riskier, which would increase the, the numbers that would be required to do them successfully. I wanna emphasize the ranges are important and that if we get more pool incentives added in addition to what we have now in England, uh, we should rework all this data to see how those things have adjusted it. So uh, the conclusions of the article, we need both push and pull incentives, things like Carbex does, but also a pull incentive like the UK subscription Netflix model or the US Pasteur Act or the programs that they're studying within Europe. Uh, there's a lot of uh, weakness in the data, especially preclinically, and therefore I chose the model, uh, the acquisition business case. You see the best estimates, you see the ranges, and the, the conclusion here is that the policies, solutions that are being proffered, the UK model, the Pastor Act, are well within the range of what's needed here. So with that, I'll stop and save any other time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. It was really a nice presentation. And it's also very nice to see lawyers and attorney uh, kind coming to help us. I think it's fascinating. We need more of these people because 
they can convince the public better than we can. From my experience, you always want a lawyer on your side. First, he showed that he understand it and, and he can transfer it in, in, a, in a different way to whoever is, you want to talk with. I think it's, it's really give us a lot of comfort. So thank you. Uh, I think the presentation was really very educating. Uh, and uh, I just, I think want to, maybe you didn't, you didn't talk about this approach, but one of the issues, as Ada said and other, that you develop a new drug and it's uh, kind of working for a while and then the, the clever bacteria find a way around it. And you have another, another a new resistant form and, and then you have to start again. And as you show, it's quite costly and not very rewarding to develop the antibiotics. So one, one of the meetings, I don't know, it was uh, online and I don't remember some companies, important company kind of were involved. And the, one of the idea is that there will be a fund and actually company will get paid, but for not using the drug, namely the drugs will be developed and only used in cases there is a need, a must to use them. And otherwise, we'll keep them in our uh, in our ammunition to kind of really fight and not repeat the mistake that was done before the drugs spread and 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 become really problematic. Although we other show us that even without exposure we get uh, resistance, but still, I believe with exposure and especially contaminating the. Contaminating Mother Earth, we get much worse uh, resistance. So, I think that's approach that was considered. I don't know what what going on with it, but I think it's very interesting approach. Yeah, th that approach is exactly what the subscription model in England and the proposed Pasteur Act and the legislative uh, analysis that's happening in Europe is designed to do. Let's pay for access to the antibiotic, yeah. but but we really don't want to use it very much in the first That's five right. or 10 years. But That's the company right. can't wait five or 10 years to get paid. You know, they need to get paid now. That's right. A steady amount every year, but the public health people can, can choose to reserve the antibiotic until we really need it in the future. Yeah, and if companies know they will get a certain sum of money, I think they will, feel safe enough, although they will not be rich out of it, but at least it cover their expenses and, and add a lot to their PR. Don't forget, this is a very major factor. Any questions to, to Kevin? Fantastic lecture. If not, again, we'll deal with it at the end, all come together as a nice story. Any questions? Okay, we go to Anna. So our next uh, speaker is uh, Anna Govet. Uh, she's project leader and future leading uh, against a AMR. And uh, Anna is uh, actually graduate from the University of Cambridge, UK, I guess, with a first class degree again going the same line as Kevin in human, social and political sciences. So it's again, someone that come to support us and, and have maybe a better way to approach the public. In July, 2021, she was extensively involved in, net, in networks, uh, working on global health issues. Uh, and, and another aspect is really overseeing uh, poverty and health, which is a major issue that also was discussed here before. Uh, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Hezi. Can you see my screen and him? And him? Yes, we do. Perfect. That's brilliant. 
But thank you so much again for that introduction and a huge thank you also to Beata Loeffler and Ralph Sudbrat for this opportunity and congratulations for a brilliant summit so far. I'm really excited to share my programme, Future Leaders Against AMR, with you all today. So um, in short, what actually is Future Leaders Against AMR? So it's an international programme which is for students and early career professionals, which is designed to support their development as future leaders in the work to curb AMR. It ran from January to March this year, and we are now in the review phase of this programme. So starting at the very beginning, let's discuss the various issues uh, further to the great issue of AMR itself, which guided the design of this programme and which motivated me to execute it in the first place. So these problems were the need for greater leadership in efforts to curb AMR both now and into the future, the need to actively encourage and support the next generation to pursue careers in the field and to act as leaders who can drive efforts forward to a pace which matches the severity of the problem throughout their professional lives, the relative shortage of those with social science backgrounds working in the field of AMR and the relative lack of fluidity, so communication and collaboration, between the scientific sector and policymakers and the social sector, which I believe sometimes leads to blinkered scientific research into AMR, which does not necessarily consider the social context. So looking at the other side of things then, what was it therefore that I actually wanted to achieve? So first, I really wanted to engage a crucial segment of the population, young people, who could supercharge work to curb AMR both at present and into the future. So the Wellcome Trust itself has been really clear in expressing the need to support young people to learn about and engage in efforts to curb AMR, given their uniquely influential position as advocates within their communities, both at present and in the future. Young people really are the next generation of leaders. I also really wanted to support students and young professionals from a range of academic and career backgrounds, um, specifically the social sciences and those disciplines outside of the biological sciences to recognize the need for their specific skills in AMR related work. Similarly, the program was intended to show those who do not come from the typical biological sciences backgrounds that it's valuable to consider alternative perspectives in future AMR research. Finally, I really wanted to create a community of engaged young people across the world, which we could draw on into the future. So how did I actually intend to do this in practice? So here you can see the timeline for the project as a whole. I have been working on the programme since August 2021 and multiple stages have been involved, including planning, publicity and recruitment, execution of the programme itself, the evaluation period, and finally the publishing of the impact report. So starting at the recruitment phase, I'll talk through these stages now. So recruitment messaging, um, this was something that was very important to decide upon because of, of course, I needed to know who exactly did I want to be the participants of this program? Who was it that I was targeting and who did I want to recruit? So first of all, I wanted students and junior professionals who were interested in AMR to any extent. I wanted to give priority to low and middle income applicants, priority to non-biological science applicants, and priority to those showing leadership aspirations. I also knew that there would be 40 places available. So the announcement of this programme and recruitment itself started on November the 1st, 2021. I did this mostly through social media. So I have a Future Leaders Against AMR account on Twitter um, and lots of other organisations uh, kindly helped me with the recruitment. So huge thanks to those who did. Um, it was also sent out on organizations' internal mailing lists, and I think that just helped to get the word out and spread awareness that this program was happening. Others actually shared out of interest, such as Minnesota's university's mailing list, and I had no idea that they were going to share it. I didn't ask them to, so it was nice that they found it interesting enough to pass it on, and I actually recruited somebody who heard about the program in that way. So the outcome of recruitment can be seen here on the screen. We had 317 applications from 57 countries. The top countries were Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, Mexico, and India. 
And for me, this was really, really encouraging. I was so pleased to see that there were so many young people from most of the countries um, that I could think of in the world who were interested in AMR and actually wanted to get involved in this programme. But of course, as I mentioned, there were only 40 places. So it was a little bit difficult to actually narrow down all of these applications. And I did this through a selection process of three stages. So the first thing was an initial registering of interest. Um, and this was so I could check the eligibility of the participants. The second stage was um, kind of involved longer responses, almost essay style questions. And then the final stage was a Zoom interview with me. And that process finished in December ready for the program to actually start in January the following year. So moving on to the execution of the program itself, um, here you can see 25 of our 40 participants in our first session together. And this was one of my favorite memories from the entire program because it was a bit of a pinch me moment that we had so many young people engaged in AMR in one room in the same place, getting to know each other and really you could just see the collaborations waiting to happen. So it was very exciting. But let's talk about the activities that the programme actually involved. So as you can see here, I decided on four categories of activities, and these were to run over the 10 week period from January 2022, and they formed the bulk of the programme. So we had lectures, panels and workshops. We had small group projects with mentorship. We had group discussions and we had independent research and reading, which was guided. So the objectives of these activities um, were to really develop a complex understanding of the major aspects of AMR, to foster an appreciation for the social perspectives in particular, and to give the participants a chance to develop key soft skills for leadership, which are transferable. There were also opportunities for intercultural communication and learning, as you saw the participants were from all over the world. And I also wanted to encourage collaboration across borders and disciplines. So the schedule of activities can be seen in much greater detail here. Um, I recognize that there's a lot of writing on this slide, um, but in short, there were just some really brilliant speakers who we were lucky enough to hear from throughout the program. And they had such a range of expertise on AMR. To name just a few, we discussed the economic angle with Dr. John Rex, the anthropological angle with Dr. Esmita Sharani and Dr. Claire Chandler. We had the behavioral science and food safety angle with the Food and Agriculture Organization. And we looked at existing initiatives with Superheroes Against Superbugs India and ICARS. Really, there were too many to name, and I'm really thankful for all of the experts and professionals who gave their time to contribute. We also had some workshops which included project management and youth engagement with Students Against Superbugs Africa. And in addition to this, each week I set complimentary reading and we discussed what we'd learn in two weekend discussion sessions. Further to this, we also had some small projects and the, this happened with mentorship from experts and professionals. So the small projects ran for six of the 10 weeks and they were a chance for the participants to put their skills and knowledge into practice in a small interdisciplinary and multicultural group. I was lucky enough to actually have an expert who were real, really experienced in those particular fields, who gave their time to guide the participants to complete their projects in the small groups. So examples of the projects included one which required the participants to evaluate the AMR communication taking place in their local languages, Another involved a review into the engagement of elected representatives in each participant's home country. And another involved designing a framework for antimicrobial exposure in the environment. So lots of different projects here. Um, we also actually decided to open one lecture a week to everybody who applied to be a part of the programme. It didn't really make sense to me to turn away interested young people. And so I wanted to give everybody who was interested a chance to get involved, even though I didn't have the capacity to take them on as full participants. So these were the 10 lectures which were open um, over the 10 weeks to anybody who wanted to come. Here we just have a few more images of the participants and I 
Um, these are some of my favorite sessions as well, just getting small groups of participants with really different academic, cultural, social backgrounds in the same place, talking about the issue of AMR, which affects us all, albeit in different ways and to different degrees at the moment. Um, it was just really eye-opening actually to hear first-hand accounts of people who they themselves had suffered resistant infections. Um, some really interesting discussions took place and I feel very lucky to have been privy to those. And here's an image of us in our final session together. Uh, this was the closing presentation where the participants shared their, the outputs of their projects with everybody else. So moving on to the evaluation of the programme, which is what I've been doing over the last month or so. On the screen are some quotes directly from the participants themselves. And I feel that these really reflect the general feedback. Uh, firstly, I think the participants really enjoyed the interdisciplinary nature of the programme and the chance to expose themselves to academic fields which they hadn't previously been exposed to. They also appreciated the chance to learn and practice soft skills. They liked the chance to meet like-minded young people from across the world and to network with those who were already working in the field of AMR. But most importantly to me, Lots of the participants said that their confidence to carry out AMR related projects had seriously increased. So as you can see here, before the program, just 7.6% of participants said they felt confident carrying out a project related to AMR. But after the program, this had increased to 100%, which I think is a, a really positive outcome. Of course, there are always things that we can improve on. And um, for me, Altering the timing and the time zones were quite a challenge. Of course, we had people spread across the entire world. So often the Australian participants had to catch up on recordings, which I think was a bit of a shame for them, but there's only so much I can do. Um, we also decided that it would be important to expand beyond English in the future. Um, I noticed that there were participants who felt that their level of English was holding them back. Um, or had mentioned that friends and colleagues were reluctant to get involved because they didn't feel like they had a good enough command of English. And so I think going forward, I'd love to carry this out in Spanish, French, um, et cetera, just to get as many young people involved as possible. And finally, six weeks for projects was very tight. Uh, that's not a lot of time at all for what they were being asked to do. So if this program was to be repeated, I think it would be good to increase the amount of time that they had for that. Looking to the future then, um, I, there are a couple of things that I want to do to ensure that there is a legacy of the programme. First of all, the impact report is due to be released this month. The PAR Foundation has um, opened up uh, early career grants for young people like myself who want to run AMR projects and they offer some funding, which I think is a great step in the right direction to get lots of young people involved. AMR Insights and I want to set up a young ambassador network over the summer so that young people can stay connected and work on projects together. I'm organizing an AMR symposium in French with some um, Francophone African young people who are very passionate about translating the issue into French. And um, I would love to collaborate a little bit more with some Nigerian medical influencers who have huge audiences on social media. And of course, it's important to support other existing youth initiatives, some of which you can see on the screen here. So a huge thank you again to um, Beat and also Ralph, and thank you, Kersi, for facilitating this session and for having me. <laughs> thank you very much, and that's everything. Okay, Anna, really very nice. Another dimension, the education, which I think is really critical. It's really critical because the more people you expose, the more ambassadors you have. As you said, I like the word, the more you propagate the message, the better you are because we need the public to put pressure on, on the government and even on the company to say why you are not, today it's quite why you are not supporting things like that. I think it's really important. Uh, I think you said a lot of languages, but <clears throat> one ma major language you missed is the Chinese. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of, but I did some short reading and China is one of the worst countries regarding resistance because the expo exposure there to antibiotics was wide in the, you can find it everywhere. And let's say if you compare 
the amount of resistant bacteria in Beijing to and Shanghai, it's about three times what we have in New York and London. So it's really, really bad issue. We talk about 70% of the bacteria of Staphylococcus are resistant bacteria, it's terrible. So I think you should aim to this and they also need a lot of education. So you should find the Chinese partner and really doing it. I, I think it's important for the world. Okay, Anna, thank you. I'll open it for some questions. And if not, we keep it for the final discussion. Question to Anna. Okay, don't worry, you will get a lot of them later. Thank you, it was really nice to hear. Okay, we're moving forward. And uh, our next uh, speaker is Ursula. Uh, and uh, she's from the Center of, uh, of uh, Anti-Infective uh, Agents in Vienna. And Ursula, uh, actually is independent expert for the antibacterial drug research and discovery and development and, and, uh, and policy based on clinical and public health needs. A broad area of expertise includes public and philanthropic, that's very important, funding strategies for antibacterial drug R&D and uh, in, in initiative uh, to, to recover the global pipeline. And that's very important. Ursula, you get the stage. Well, thank you very much for this um, kind introduction. So in my presentation, I would like to give you an overview of antibacterial drug R&D, of the clinical pipeline, uh, the, and the challenges of drug discovery. So in general, I will talk about what we need and what we get. Um, what, what do we need? I'm talking here uh, from a public health view globally. We need new antibiotics without cross-resistance to existing classes. Uh, the ones that are active against the extensively drug-resistant or pan drug resistant pathogens. Most likely um, to achieve with a new chemical or functional class, a new target or binding site, and a new mode of action. So these new drugs should be active against the critical priority from negative pathogens. And they should have a spectrum that allows also empirical therapy for common indications. This is uh, very important because I think it has been a little bit uh, 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 neglected in recent uh, years when we were um, mainly talking about uh, patient-specific therapies or pathogen-specific therapies. So I will guide you uh, through the clinical pipelines, but don't be afraid. Uh, you don't need to look at, at, at any details. I will guide you through. So the, the red field is beta-lactams beta in combination uh, with beta-lactamase inhibitors. You see, these are the most uh, common um, uh, antibiotics in phase three. Uh, this is a very well-known strategy. Um, and we see small improvements of this established concept, but they are not really a solution for the most resistant gram negative bacteria uh, due to increasing resistance to these new combinations, but also other resistance mechanisms than beta lactamases. Uh, what you can also see here is Clostridioides uh, difficile. Um, we have uh, small molecules, but also um, uh, uh, microbiome modifying therapies. So C. Uh, difficile um, is not the most relevant problem globally, but it's important in high income countries. So this focus on C. difficile continues in the pipeline 
and we can also see that in phase two uh, drugs. So here again, a lot of new drugs and then new concepts. Um, we have uh, new small molecules. Uh, these are really new targets, uh, completely new classes. Um, the reason why we find them mainly in the Clostridium difficile group is because uh, uh, they don't ha have to deal with um, complex pharmacokinetics. They are not absorbed and also not with toxicity, with a systemic uh, toxicity. Uh, otherwise, we have uh, new drugs, um, also with new targets uh, against Staphylococcus aureus. So this uh, phase two uh, slide here is really typical for, for the pipelines. Uh, Step aureus, Clostridium. Uh, in this phase two, we don't have the beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. But if you move on to phase one drugs, um, we see again, it's um, very populated with this beta lactamase inhibitor combinations. Um, we have a lot of different beta lactamase inhibitors, but also uh, different uh, antibiotics that they are combined with. Uh, what is noticeable and is uh, really, I think, a success uh, is that we will get oral uh, antibiotics from these combinations. So some um, indications, for instance, um, uh, urinary tract infections uh, will really benefit from the option of, a, of an oral uh, therapy. Um, this this um, uh, slide looks very, uh, very full with different uh, antibiotics, but uh, there's also a high attrition rate uh, from phase one to phase three. Uh, I guess that um, many of, of these antibiotics will not advance, especially the ones that are modifications of uh, existing classes. Uh, tetracyclines, aminoglycosids. Uh, so it's really uh, the question if uh, these uh, uh, modified classes will find enough interest to find investment and also companies that will uh, go to um, the expensive phase three uh, phases. So I really uh, doubt this. Um, we have not that many uh, approaches against uh, gram-negative um, bacteria, here just two. We'll see if they survive a phase one. Um, this is always a, a, the, the problem of toxicity that you may find in, in phase one, uh, but we'll see. Uh, from biologics, we have Pages. And again, uh, see difficile microbiome modifying uh, therapies. So um, this is these are the non-traditional uh, approaches, and especially phages uh, have been regarded as uh, somehow uh, the future, and they will rescue us. Um, but we should not forget that they are very patient tailored. That means they are really uh, tailored to an individual patient and uh, you need to have the time for, for this um, sophisticated diagnostic that's uh, necessary to do. Um, the other aspect is it's mostly something for high income countries because uh, you need uh, this, this infrastructure. Um, that is not, not available in low and middle income countries, uh, usually. So um, <clears throat> this uh, was a very brief walkthrough through the clinical um, pipeline. And uh, I'll give you one other 
overview and that's uh, the summary of, of the clinical pipeline. Um, you can see hmm, the old classes. Uh, here are the most prominent um, uh, group. Uh, we see uh, the beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations. They are the only hmm, or mainly um, the group uh, that has a spectrum against uh, gram-negative bacteria. Uh, though mainly enterobacteria. And you can see that they are focused on very specific uh, resistance uh, mechanisms. Uh, if there are other resistance mechanisms, then they will not work. The second big group is, uh, as mentioned already, C. difficile uh, with new classes, small molecule new, new classes, um, and uh, six microbiome modifying approaches. Um, the, the new classes are mainly uh, directed against C. difficile, staphylococci, and Yes, also uh, two against Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, biologics, this is something that's, um, that we are not uh, really used to yet. So uh, there are quite new approaches. Um, both are uh, against uh, uh, staphylococci. So this is an overview of the clinical uh, pipeline. You may say it's, it's great, but what are the problems with this pipeline? Um, this, this Lancet uh, study has been mentioned already before. Um, and um, um, what I would like to show you is the problem of um, the differences in geographic distribution of resistance. Here are just two examples. So the regions with the blue purple colors have the least uh, resistance problem. And the more you go to red, uh, the worse the, the problem is. So if you are in North America, for instance, let's take this example here, you develop an antibiotic, you're sitting there and developing an antibiotic um, that wants to solve a problem of the red countries, that's great. But then you want to sell them again in your blue country. And this just doesn't work well because the need is very different in the blue countries, blue regions compared uh, to the red regions. And if this is not really getting together, then you have this mismatch uh, between supply and, and need. And then you also have, uh, of course, the, um, the commercial problems because uh, high priced uh, drugs for specific resistance problems that are really very small in, in this region will not be that uh, successful. So um, what is the situation of anti antibacterial drug R&D? Um, we have antibiotics with a focus on specific resistance mechanisms, and they are developed in and for high income countries. The major need for affordable antibiotics and high prevalence of these resistance mechanisms is in low and middle income countries. So a clear mismatch. Um, the, the sales of modified classes, of old classes against specific resistance me me mechanisms and the need is low in high income countries. So we are always talking about global uh, situation but we are not really acting in a global way. The resistance against modified old classes is rising 
with increased usage. So there, there is resistance already when it's, uh, it's, it starts to be used in patients, but it's increased um, with use because the resistance mechanisms and the old classes are known also to bacteria and the resistance mechanisms are there already. Um, the pathogen specific therapies that are often mentioned, um, they require efficient, fast and affordable diagnostics and also enough, enough time to delay treatment. And in many uh, situations, you don't have this time. So I, this is my last one. I'm, I just wanted to, um, um, to mention the discovery challenges that we have. We need discovery, R&D support and funding because otherwise the preclinical pipelines will not deliver the antibiotics that we then need in the clinical pipelines. So with this, uh, I'm, I'm ending my presentation. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you very much. I think we, you brought us up to date on a kind of new development, and that's very, very important. But more important is on the issue, on the kind of difference between the, the rich country and the poor countries, and the, and the country that have high uh, level of of resistance and low level of resistance. And that's, it seems to be quite difficult to solve, but we have to deal with it. And, and really, if not, if we'll not get coordination, we'll be in a very bad shape, right? Yes, and we, okay. have, we have a discovery problem. That's very okay. important. Okay, that, that's important to learn, I think. And uh, especially, you know, kind of organization like uh, like WHO and all other global organization have to really pay attention to it and really do things that can kind of make a compromise between all these needs. Okay, uh, so I'm looking forward for a question uh, uh, to Ursula. If not, we'll keep it for the final because then we have all the topic in discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Ursula. Okay, we move uh, forward ahead and uh, our our uh, next speaker is uh, Christine Ardal and. Uh, Christine is a, is a senior researcher, <coughs> biotech, and, and uh, she has MBA and PhD degrees. She worked for over 20 years on, a, on, a, on access to medicine through different sectors, including research, institute, government, development, assistance, assistance philanthropy, National Health Services and, and, and Insurance. Wow. <clears throat> Ardal, uh, Christine was uh, previously the colleague of, of the research and in innovation work package for the, for the European Union, uh, joint action on anti, on AMR. I think, uh, well, look like uh, we are looking forward to hear you. Thank you so much. Thanks for that kind invitation. Um, so I'm going to be talking from our, my experience with the joint action on uh, antimicrobial resistance and healthcare associated infections. For those of you who aren't familiar with joint actions, it's a tool that the European Commission uses uh, to promote uh, collaboration across uh, Europe. So uh, the, let's see here. Um, just a little bit about the joint action. Uh, so our aim was to foster synergies to relate AMR and healthcare associated infections among the EU member states. There was 26 participating countries. So we considered that quite a success. 
Now we focused on all aspects of AMR, looking at surveillance, infection prevention and control, stewardship, as well as research and innovation. But we also focused on awareness and visibility. And one of the fun things that we did is we created a symbol. Um, so this is the antibiotic resistant symbol. I'm wearing one, I've made it myself. You too can uh, make one yourself and wear it. Uh, it is a good way to make other people aware about the perils of antibiotic resistance. No copyright, so feel free, please craft one of your own and make it yourself and wear it with pride. Thank you. So as Kevin mentioned, um, there's a worrying trend, not only of lack of innovation, but also delayed ability for new antibiotics. Um, and this is another version of a slide that he showed you already. But what shows um, the antibiotics that were approved um, through the regulators between 2010 to 2019, and uh, where they were made available. So all the blank space, for example, I'm sitting in Norway and all of these blank space means that these antibiotics are not yet available in Norway. Now, as Ursula said, um, there's very different public health needs um, between uh, high income European countries and other parts uh, of the world. So in some cases, um, it's probably not a problem that we don't have access to some of these antibiotics in Europe because they don't offer public health value. But the problem is, is that we can see the newer antibiotics are not available in a wide swath of European countries, that this becomes a precedent. And there's an expectation that the European market is not an attractive market for antibiotics and therefore we don't get access to antibiotics. So of course, uh, that is a problem. Um, so as Kevin mentioned before, pull incentives. So a pull incentive is basically um, something that's available once uh, uh, an antibiotic is approved or an antibacterial is approved that basically makes all of the investments um, that were done to bring that antibiotic to market worthwhile. That it makes it's the profits at uh, once you start uh, commercializing and selling the antibiotic. Um, and a delinked pull incentive means that those profits aren't dependent upon consumption. The amount of money the company makes is not linked to how many unit sales of that antibiotic. And this is something that we've been talking about now, Kevin and Ursula and I and others uh, regarding, we've been talking about this now for five, six years, or maybe even more um, about how we can implement this. And there are, there is actually quite a bit of progress in Europe, um, as well as uh, uh, the US is also looking at this. So I want to take a country by country look at how uh, countries are working on this and then talk about it in the European perspective. So first in France, um, France is the one who's actually been working on this the longest. And what France is doing in, in order to try to uh, improve the profitability of, of effective antibiotics is first they want to do a health technology assessment. So a health technology assessment is, is, is an assessment that shows whether or not the product is cost effective and how cost effective the medicine is. Um, so uh, what they do is they look at added therapeutic benefit for the patient. And if a an, uh, medicine can demonstrate an added therapeutic benefit for the patient through the clinical evidence of moderate or higher, then France guarantees it a price um, across four reference countries. So it basically guarantees it a fairly good price um, as long as the clinical evidence is sufficient. But as Ursula told you, antibiotics are approved on non-inferiority clinical trials, meaning that an antibiotic can only show you that it is not inferior to a comparator antibiotic, which tends to be a generic antibiotic. Now in this system, and you can understand it, why would countries want to pay more for an antibiotic that doesn't give added public health benefit? But in the case, France understands that it's difficult to generate this evidence. And they say that if you can provide more evidence, uh, a little bit more evidence uh, so that at least it meets the minor added therapeutic benefit uh, criteria, then they will bump up that antibiotic to the moderate level, to meaning that it will get a price equivalent to the four reference countries. 
Um, and France has already done this uh, for th here's three antibiotic combinations that have already achieved this bump up to a higher unit price. Um, and the important thing is, is that two of these were done through reevaluation. So France is open to uh, understanding that new evidence comes along. So phase three clinical trials are still being performed after the antibiotic has been approved. Um, so evidence from those trials can be used to reevaluate the price and bump it up to that higher level. There's not many countries in Europe that actually will increase the price. Uh, so it, it's nice that uh, France is showing the way in this. Now, another thing that France is doing is they're looking at the diagnosis related group. And so hospitals are reimbursed based upon diagnosis related groups. They get one payment for a bundle of services and medicines. And this often includes an antibiotic, but often a generic, a cheap generic antibiotic. So if um, the antibiotic um, is for hospital inpatients and can demonstrate added therapeutic value and has a cost exceeding 30% of the relevant diagnosis related group, um, France will uh, allow a hospital to carve out that price and be reimbursed for that medicine. And in, for example, fidaxomycin for C. difficile uh, is one that France will allow that. So these are different um, mechanisms to increase the unit price um, for effective antibiotics. Um, Germany has recently implemented a, a pilot study last year where they've defined a new term called a reserve antibiotic. And the reserve antibiotic is again, one that demonstrates public health need. Um, and is exempt from reference pricing. So it starts automatically in price negotiations. Um, so the first step, there's two steps uh, to be considered a, a reserve antibiotic in Germany. Firstly, um, it has to be effective against at least one pathogen on the German priority pathogen list. Now, Germany's created its own priority pathogen list. It's very similar to the WHO priority pathogen list with a, a couple of additions. Um, and so if a new antibiotic is approved for a pathogen specific indication for the treatment of a multi-drug resistant organism infection, then it, it moves straight to the reserve antibiotic classification. But as you might know, this doesn't happen very often. Pathogen specific indications are quite rare. Um, and so there's another pathway as well uh, that if it's approved for treatment, uh, of a potentially serious infection and some efficacy against a multi-drug resistant organism was shown. Then, and the second step is that there are no or only limited clinically equivalent treatment options. So it seems to be effective. There's very few other treatment options. Then as well, it can go and be classified as reserve antibiotic. Now, as far as I understand, there's only one antibiotic today that's, that started this very new process, and that's cefidericol. Um, and what that means is that you know, cefidericol could have a, a much higher unit price uh, to be refunded through the German government, which of course is, is good news. But really what we want to, to finance is we wanna make sure, especially if we're gonna start talking about pathogen-specific infections, um, that there is a revenue stream um, that is sufficient um, to ensure that the antibiotic stays in the market. Um, and so there's two what we call delinked uh, pull incentives that have been implemented. And the first is in Sweden. Um, so Sweden has implemented in 2019 an annual revenue guarantee. So what Sweden says is that we want access uh, to new antibiotics against uh, critical priority pathogens. Uh, even though Sweden uses very little antibiotics, uh, 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 drug resistance, antibiotic resistance is quite low in Sweden, uh, but they still wanna have access to these antibiotics in case of the patients that have multi-drug resistant infections. So what they've said is we will guarantee um, uh, that uh, each antibiotic, each marketing authorization holder for each of these five antibiotics that have been selected will receive an income of 4 million Swedish kroner per year, which is about 400,000 euros per year, which maybe isn't a lot of money. But when you think about it, Sweden uses almost a handful of these, these antibiotics. So the, the use is, is very low. 
But the nice thing about this model is that Sweden purchases its antibiotics by hospitals. So they're purchased by the regions. So all of this can go on as per normal. There's no changes to the normal system. And then at the end of the year, when Sweden finds out how much of the, each of these antibiotics it is used, then it tops up to the 4 million kroner. So looking at this Swedish uh, surveillance data to date, um, Sweden's using very little of these antibiotics, so it will be a top up to that 4 million. But in the case that they actually needed to use more and, and they exceeded the 4 million, the company will actually get a bonus for participating in the scheme because there are some requirements about holding some stock locally in Sweden and, and distribution timeframes to receive the antibiotics. The other um, fully delinked pilot that's going on is happening in England. So England, the UK decided uh, to pilot this uh, only in England, not in Wales, Scotland, or Northern Ireland. Um, and what they've done is they've also based this on health technology assessment. So they've done forecasts of the value of health benefits provided by two new antimicrobials, cephedericol. So this is cephedericol you saw as well in Sweden, and you also saw it in the German uh, application. So we're seeing that there is some coherence around which of the antibiotics seem to be high value to meet uh, unmet public health need. And they've also included keftazidine abibactam, which is a little bit older antibiotic, still patented, but released about five years ago. Now, as Kevin mentioned, um, this is quite revolutionary because what NICE is the body that does the health technology assessments in England and uh, the rest of the UK, they're looking not only at patient value, but they're also looking at what we call societal value. So how does having access to these two antibiotics um, provide insurance uh, to English uh, society? How does it provide diversity or protection against transmission or enablement for other services? So NICE has just uh, published their assessments about two weeks ago. The links are uh, at the bottom of this slide. Um, and they've said that based upon uh, the assessments of the HTA, they will award up to 10 million pounds per year per antibiotic. And that's informed by the HTA. Now, both HTAs seem to uh, say that the, both of these antibiotics qualify for this top level. And the pull incentives means that the England will pay 10 million or what the number that they decide per year uh, per antibiotic for as little or as much of the antibiotic as they need. Now, they've also implemented stringent stewardship requirements. So there's not an expectation that these antibiotics will, will be overused. And the hospitals will continue to pay a unit price to ensure that they're not overused. Um, but this is a nice way to say that uh, England values these two antibiotics. The companies are guaranteed uh, revenue. Um, and uh, so this is a, a nice example of a fully delinked pull incentive. So uh, Rolf mentioned that uh, through uh, some uh, collaboration with the global AMR R&D hub, uh, we, through the joint action, also looked at a pan-European pull incentive. Um, so the first thing that we did is we had in-depth interviews with 13 countries, 10 of them uh, European countries, uh, to try to understand what are the barriers and what are the opportunities for implementing a European-wide or a multinational pull incentive. Um, because I think that it, it's abundantly clear from the conversations today that we need to pay for antibiotics differently. We need to stop paying for consumption, but start paying for to have access to them. Um, and so we went and talked with policymakers and AMR experts in uh, 13 countries, and 11 of those countries expressed support for new incentives for antibiotics. So they were basically, they knew that we needed to pay for antibiotics differently, um, and they were supportive of trialing new economic models. So that's great because really um, you know, the evidence for that is only about five or six years old. Um, so that shows that there is a, a general understanding that antibiotics are different. Um, 11 out of 13 countries want a common multinational incentive, but they want it only if it's independent from national medicine pricing, procurement and reimbursement processes. 
Now that's that's understandable because if you think about, for example, within Europe, uh, each country has very unique pricing, procurement, and reimbursement processes that are very tailored to individual countries. And they really don't want these processes to be modified for a handful of antibiotics that they really don't expect to use much of. Um, and so we need to look for incentives that work across countries, but don't interfere with these existing processes. They also said that in nine out of the 11 countries, they indicated a preference for a model that ensures access to both old and new antibiotics, often with the highest priority giving to older antibiotics. And that's because, as you probably know, shortages of older antibiotics is, is a huge problem in Europe. Um, especially for the narrow spectrum antibiotics. Uh, there's a lot of shortages. It's difficult to have a stable supply. So a pull incentive could ideally work for both to ensure se secure access to both old and new antibiotics. So based upon this feedback, we came up with a proposal from the joint action. Um, and I'll just walk you through this quickly. So the idea is that the EMA could identify those antibiotics matching public health needs. So out of those antibiotics coming to market, which are those that really show some clinical evidence of meeting an unmet public health need? And also countries at the same time could come up with their list of important antibiotics with vulnerable supply chains. This could be sent to the European Commission. Um, now we've learned a lot through COVID-19 about uh, how, especially in Europe, about how to purchase COVID-19 vaccines. So basing that learning uh, into this model, we think that the European Commission could do a joint tender um, for the revenue guarantee. And this is similar to what Sweden has implemented. So saying that a group of European countries guarantee a fixed annual uh, revenue Per, to, to the innovator of a new and important antibiotic. Um, and they would sign the contracts for this revenue uh, guarantee. So countries would opt in. So not every European country has to participate, but those that want to opt in, as well as companies would opt in. But when a company opts in, they not only sign up for the revenue guarantee, but they commit to access, uh, to provide access to the antibiotic in every um, European country that has opted in. Then you could have the normal national procurement and reimbursement processes continue as per normal. And at the end of the year, the European Commission would tell the countries how much they owe, and uh, then the countries would so there would be stewardship provisions as well to make sure that the, the antibiotic is well stewarded. Now this, we think that this is um, probably the most feasible pull incentive to be implemented in Europe. There are other options as well, um, but uh, they're very expensive, whereas this could be a, a cost-effective um, uh, model to go forward. So I just wanted to take a minute to talk about um, the clinical evidence, because as you can hear, <coughs> Um, in order to pay more, they want- Christine, you have to start finishing. Okay, I've got just uh, two quick things left. So they wanna see better clinical evidence um, and uh, there are some new clinical trial networks that are available to do this. So if you're looking to see how can uh, I create better clinical evidence, there's the ACRED within Europe. And then uh, there's a Southeast Asian network that Welcome Trust has developed, which is Advanced ID. So both of these brand new clinical trial networks for infectious diseases should enable uh, better evidence. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. It's uh, again, in kind of add another dimension to what we need and uh, we can see how broad is the issue, how complicated it is. Uh, any question to Christine? Okay, so we'll discuss it in the in the round table at the end. Uh, we are going to our next speaker, Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo. Ricardo Nisato is, is uh, we will talk about novel drug for quality of life 
in bacterial infection and, and uh, Enricardo is a licensing and grant associated manager, again adding another dimension to our to our session uh, with over 20 years of, of experience in R&D and business development in academic, hospital, pharmaceutical industry, uh, environments. Dr. Nisato has held the top management position in various star startups and currently managing the in and out licensing activities of the antibacterial at the Swiss-based biopharmaceutical company, Depo Biopharm. Okay, we are looking forward to hear you, Ricardo. Perfect, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Not very well, very weak. Okay, so we made the test before, but then... Uh... Now it's better a little bit. Okay, so let's try that way. You have to come so, closer to the mic. Yeah, I'm eating it. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for, uh, thank you. Thank, I would like to thank the organizers and especially um, Ralf Sadbrak and uh, Professor Beat Loeffler for giving me the opportunity to speak about our company and then our effort in AMR. And then uh, basically I will start with one drug for one bug and uh, to talk about our uh, FABI inhibitors, which are pathogen-specific antibiotics for the treatment of AMR infections. But to start with, I would like to introduce the company. The company was funded in 1979. It's a Swiss company. Uh, it's family-owned. This is a very important point, and then counts over 400 employees at the moment. We have three different companies within the group, the Biofarm International, which is the farm industry, the Biofarm Research and Manufacturing, and Innovation Fund. And then we uh, focus on oncology and anti-infectives. So it's a family-owned owned company, meaning that we're not on the stock exchange. So we do what the family wants, and the family is quite visionary and altruistic. Not uh, working for free, obviously, but then at least we have a vision in terms of AMR needs and what we want to do. Uh, we have a peculiar model in which we have little drug discovery. We in-license technology at the level of uh, drug discovery, preclinical stage, we develop drugs, and then we don't have a sales force. We usually out-license the technologies uh, to global partners in uh, phase two, usually, or phase three clinical trials. Some examples of success, it's oxaliplatin in oncology, uh, colorectal cancer. Most of the people know it as a Sanofi product, but it was developed by actually by uh, the Biofarm in Switzerland and tryptorelin, which was developed as well um, by the Biofarm in prostate cancer. So this product has been on the market for over 35 years. And this is thanks to our knowledge in the PLGA technology and life cycle management. This is important to understand that we need cash in, basically, to support the effort in antibiotics. As many speakers spoke before, it's a diff difficult market if you don't have the support of the management and cash to do the, the research, you don't go that far. So our pipeline in antibiotics, we have three major programs. Afabicin, which is uh, an antibiotic against uh, staff, or staff. Uh, we developed it in uh, skin infections, successfully reached phase two clinical trials, and then we currently are doing um, phase two clinical trials in bone or joint infection. We also have in the preclinical stage two different programs, one against gonorrhea, Neisseria gonorrhea, and one against Acinetobacter bumani. Both are supported by the Carbex. We, thanks, we thank a lot the Carbex because they don't just provide money, they provide an expertise and guidance. We spoke about the antimicrobial resistance. This is no more a silent pandemic, unfortunately. As mentioned before by previous, by previous speakers, by 2050, we may reach 10, 10 million deaths per year. And currently, we reach 1.27 million deaths per year. Over 35,000 in the US, over 33,000 in Europe. 
Uh, at the biofarm, we try to respond to a need. Uh, WHO and CDC priority, priority threats. We have a list here, and then basically our programs respond to the critical and high priorities of the WHO. And as well, we have here um, the same similar priority lists. You can see that uh, um, in this case, gonorrhea is pushed to urgent in the CDC while it's uh, in high in the WHO. So definition of innovation by the WHO is defined by new chemical class, new target, new mode of action, and no cross resistance. This is from the report of the WHO in 2017 that will be updated soon. And you can see that our program, uh, frontly Rafabicin, responds to the four uh, different criteria. So what is our new mechanism of action? This is about the bacterial fatty acid synthesis uh, type two. Uh, it's essential to produce lipids that are essential for the bacterial growth and metabolism. And then you can see here, you have a specific enzyme, the enoyl acid carrier protein reductase, which can have various forms, FAB I, FAB -fa V, FAB L, FAB K. And in some bacteria, FAB I is, there's no redundancy, so FAB I is essential because bacteria are only FAB I. And our FAB I platform, actually, the three programs we're developing, FAB is in for staff, the Bio1453 for gonorrhea and the Bio1454 for acinetobacter are definitely specifically killing those bacteria. By having a new model of action, we noticed and we monitored that there is no cross resistance to any other um, antibiotic class. You have a true selectivity, and then this reduces uh, the pressure on the gut microbiota and eventually avoids dysbiosis and a super infection, um, most notably like uh, Clostridium difficile. Here's some data in um, microbiology. You can see here the MIC-90 on uh, staff from our antibiotic Afabicin. And then you can see that we can target quite specifically the Staphylococci uh, with an order of magnitude that is way higher, we can target as well the gram-positive, negative, and fermenters and others, but you can see that we, are, we have two lots different. So we can uh, safely say that we are quite pathogen specific. And we didn't see any cross resistance against uh, AMRSA, um, VISA, VRSA, and uh, LRSA. So we're pretty safe in the cross resistance. A bad microbiota, you can see here that microbiota experiments in mouse. After 10 days of treatment, you can see here the vehicle and mice treated with aflavicin. You see that you don't have that much difference in between vehicle and treated mice. <coughs> and then in comparison, you can see total dysbiosis by using other classic antibiotics, namely linozin, which is a really important one. Is a data in, uh, in human, basically, before treatment and after 20 days of treatment. This is from human gut microbiota, and by eye, you don't see that much of a difference. So in a nutshell, for the clinical trials, we uh, carried clinical trials successfully in the US for skin infections. Over than 330 patients were treated. Study objectives were met well tolerated uh, treatment, and we also demonstrated efficacy even in strains resistant to other antibiotics. We are currently uh, here in skin infection. You already have quite a few options on the table to treat those kind of infections. And then our goal was to achieve this clinical trial as a proof of concept to jump in a more difficult uh, medical indication, namely uh, bone or joint infection, in which there is a clear and met medical need. We are currently um, on, uh, performing the clinical trials in phase two. This is an open label study, randomized control trial with SARCAS control, up to 96 patients. The treatment, the, the phase two clinical trial is ongoing uh, quite well. Unfortunately, we, 
we uh, are carrying the, the clinical trial in the US and in Ukraine. And you can imagine that in Ukraine, we have some difficulties. Unfortunately, well, there's a war, so we're not going to complain about our clinical trial. We hope for the best for the Ukraine population. Uh, objectives and current results, safety after long treatment duration, efficacy, we, we already have some efficacy and successful recruitment ongoing. Now I want to focus a bit more on the preclinical um, um, programs we have on gonorrhea. So the mission is to develop a novel specific FABI inhibitor for drug resistant uh, gonorrhea infections. We target uh, the indications as follow genital, rectal, and pharyngeal gonorrhea infections, and the development stage is IND enabled. You can see here in a mouse model that uh, vaginal model of Neisseria gonorrhea that we have a quite consistent and quantitative dose response. And this was obtained, obtained by uh, oral administration as well as subcutaneous administration. So we can safely claim that we have an excellent, excellent safety, safe, excellent sorry, efficacy. After one day of treatment, we can reach five log k. Uh, regarding the, the bio 1454, this is the Acinetobacter Bomani program. The mission is to develop a novel specific FABI inhibitor for A Bomani infections. This is a tricky one because it's targeting hospital acquired pneumonia HAP, and ventilator associated pneumonia VAP. And the program is actually at the DC nomination stage. Here you can see some data in a neurine pneumonia model. We can reach uh, 3.5 log kill uh, after 24 to 72 hours. Here you have um, uh, time zero vehicle after. Uh, 24 hours, vehicle at 72 hours, and you can see here a positive control. And then with our lead compound, you, you can easily see there's a uh, very excellent efficacy. So in the summary, in a nutshell, our FABI platform, the key attributes, we basically covered all the four WHO innovation criteria, namely a uh, new mechanism of action targeting an essential, essential pathway, new target, new chem chemical class, and low potential for emergence of resistance. So this, this approach are pathogen specific, and then therefore we spare the microbiome. And obviously this is a kind of a platform so we can potentially expand to other priority pathogens. And uh, that's my last slide, I've been quite quick. Um, and then I would like to summarize the issue that the, the field uh, has, namely there's a resistance from the biology, but there's a resistance from the market. As we all know, the antibiotic market is notoriously known to be broken. And then push and pull incentives are key to develop new antibiotics. Um, we, several speakers before mentioned that the big pharma has fled uh, the field because of the cost, uh, the cost of development are not rewarded. And then only small companies, startups and uh, small entities like, like ours actually are still active. And we believe that we, we can make a difference because we have a new mechanism of action, a new platform that could make a difference, but then we, also have the support from a family that is visionary, but we cannot uh, last forever without having the support. And uh, last but not least is we, we've been hearing from different speakers before that the, um, there are push pull incentives, um, UK, Sweden, but then this is really too sporadic. We've been hearing for quite a few years that something will be put in place. And then people are dying. The Lancet from January is really dramatic. We believe that we should have a stronger support and faster support because we, no one can stand this situation. The, this is from the society perspective, medical perspective. 
uh, pharma perspective as well. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, we can take some questions later on, I guess. We cannot hear you. I'm mute, now I'm unmute. Thank you very much. I said uh, it's really nice to hear uh, some representative of a company that uh, that is uh, ready to invest in uh, in such kind of what people claim non-rewarding uh, drugs. I don't believe it's the case really, but that's the kind of the common uh, feeling on the on the market. So very nice, and the work is also very nice. I really like some of the data or most of the data. Look very promising. So. First of all, good luck. And I hope you Thank succeeded you. to go through phase three and get uh, EMA and, a and FDA and other authorities approving the drug. It will be very, very important. So let's see if there are questions to you. You, you also finished before the time, which is very good. Uh, any question to, to Ricardo? Okay, I, again, I'm sure that there will be questions uh, at, the, at the final round table. So now we go to our, our, West, our, our uh, next speaker, Dr. Auba Seren, uh, just for a, a kind of complete uh, disclosure, Auba was my PhD student uh, together with another uh, instructor, Professor Amiram Goldblum, and she uh, now managed some product, some project in my labs. And, and, in my, and one of them is the nanomopirocin that result from the, her PhD thesis. And I let her to tell you about this, uh, <clears throat> this which I believe very interesting and very potential uh, antibiotics. <clears throat> Okay, so Over, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Hezi, for the introduction and for the organizers for the opportunity to present here. And uh, listening to all the lectures before, I think that uh, our uh, our lecture will deal with the opportunity of nanotechnology to help in this field. So, as Hezi said before, this uh, study has started from my PhD test that is in, in which we tried to look for new molecules that will be uh, suitable for nanoliposomal delivery. And we broadly uh, created two types of models, models that will predict the loading to the nanoliposome, so that we'll have a drug that is highly loaded into the nanoliposomes, and those that will not leak upon storage. And this, uh, this figure is the output of screening of more than 30,000 molecules. And you can see here that most of the molecules are here, we received negative score, and only a few were positive in these models. And we further screened for those that were only a highly scored molecules and those that were FDA approved, and received some 67 molecules. And among them, we discovered mupirotin, and we learned about the special story of this molecule and decided to continue to experiment the testing of uh, the molecule. So mupirotin is uh, an antibiotic with a unique mode of action, which is not shared with any other marketed antibiotic. And we heard the importance of this, uh, of these characteristics in antibiotics. But although it is so unique, it is used only topically due to rapid elimination and high quality in binding that prevent its efficacious by injection. So our idea was to take this topical cream antibiotic, which rapidly degraded in the circulation, showing no cross resistance and was found to be safe upon injection when inject to, injected to health volunteers and use pegylated nanoliposomes in order to transform it to an injectable antibiotic that can treat deep infections due to resistant bacteria. I, will, I think I will skip this slide about the importance of antimicrobial resistance and this number which were mentioned in, in the other slides. Just want to add that this was also mentioned before the importance of antimicrobial resistance 
in cancer treatment, which really relies on antibiotic efficacy. And I think it's important because many of the audience in this conference are working on cancer treatments. And it's, it's important to know that infections are one of the most frequent complications cancer patients as previously uh, described. And uh, it that is play a primary role in the cause of death of approximately 50% of patients with hematological malignancies or solid tumors. And a UK sur a survey in, in, with a, a hundred UK oncologists also highlighted this problem when 90%, 95% of the oncologists that were surveyed said that they are worried about uh, this problem and what it means for the future of cancer yeah. treatment, saying that many a common cancer treatment could not could become too risky or impossible to give. So this is another aspect of the antimicrobial, resi or the antimicrobial resistant problem. So going back to uh, pyrrotine and nanopyrrotine, that here is the spectrum of activity of pyrrotine related to the WHO priority pathogen list that was mentioned in the, in the lectures before. The, the pathogens here in the um, green uh, squares are those that mupirotin is active against. You can see that mupirotin is active against most of the pathogens in the high and medium uh, list. And it is also active, again, at the bacteria with synerg synergism with cholestin. Okay, so knowing the uh, special mode of action of mupirotin, we, uh, it suggests that it should not show cross resistance and we try to look into it. The first study uh, I mentioned here is a study with 94 uh, gonorrhea uh, clinical isolates that was performed by Southern Research and sponsored by the NIH. And in this study, mupirotin was active against all the, the isolates uh, tested, no matter what was the resistant profile of the isolates. And it also was active against uh, an isolate that was resistant to both cefixim and ceftriaxone, which is the first line therapy for gonorrhea. Additional study tested 167 gram positive isolate performed at IHMA. And again, nanopyrotin showed no cross resistance. Some of the staff hours were uh, resistant to pyrotin in the range of uh, having MSC in the range of 16 to 64 microgram per ml, but there was no, uh, no um, relation to the to the methicillin resistant status or uh, resistant to vancomycin, daptomycin, and nezolide. So no cross resistance was, was uh, shown. And for the streptococcus azolites, protein and nanoprotein were uh, active against all of the isolates tested. Another study was performed at uh, Public Health of England with 115 isolates of vancomycin resistant to bacterium fascium. And again, nanoprotein. Mopiotin was active against all the isolates tested and showed no cross resistance with either vancomycin or lenezolate. So, working as on the individual studies, we discovered that mopiotin and nanopiotin showed very similar MSC values, which was surprising knowing that most of the drug is encapsulated in the nanoliposomes. And here is a study performed by our collaborator, the collaborator in Germany, in Helmholtz, Center of uh, Infection Research. And they tried to look for the, um, for the activity of nanopyrotin itself. And the way they did it is by incubating staph owls in the presence of, of different dilutions of plasma. And in, in case plasma is in the dilution, spermopyrotin, is much less active because it's highly bound to plasma proteins. And as you can see here, nanopyrotin was bactericidal. At all uh, uh, plasma dilutions tested, uh, it killed all the staph hours in the incubation compared to much less activity of nanopyrotin. And this important study showed that nanopyrotin is active against the bacteria while encapsulated inside the liposome and differentiated the activity of nanopyrotin itself from the free drug. This is another study that uh, they performed, which is uh, a time-dependent uh, uptake of uh, mopirotin over the incubation time, and they compared fermopirotin with nanomopirotin, 
Again, you can see that umpirocin is delivered more efficiently into the bacteria when formulated as non -umpirocin. They also tested the intracellular activity of uh, nanomperocin, and this was done by peritoneal macrophages isolated from infected mice. Here you can see the intracellular activity inside the macrophages of nanomperocin, which was able to, keep, to kill the bacteria inside the macrophages, a very important uh, characteristic for staph house. And this is a, a live cell imaging that they uh, performed when incubated macrophages in vitro with staph house uh, labeled in green and uh, fluorescent labeled the nanomopyrotene in red. And you can see here that both are accumulated inside the macrophages, explaining the activity of nanomopyrotene against the bacteria inside the macrophages. So in, summary, in summary, the invicta activity of uh, nanopyrotin is promising in terms of the need for new antibacterial uh, developments because the, the spectrum of activity fits that of the high and medium priority list of the WHO. And most importantly, it showed no cross resistance with commercial available antibiotics. It demonstrated direct activity against bacteria and the nanoliposomal carrier showed better uptake and activity on phagocytic cells. Now we will move to the in vivo studies showing uh, the efficacy upon injection. I really summarize it in very, very short way. The first study uh, which was performed in Adassa is a study is a necrotizing fasciitis model in which group A streptococcus is injected to the back of the mice and the injection of the bacteria causes a lesion in the skin followed by a systemic disease. Here is a, we, performed many studies in this model. Here is only the dose response study showing no survival of the animals two days after infections compared to survival of the animals that injected with the different doses. There is difference, but, but the, the mortality is delayed by at least one to two days. And at a higher group of 11 to 57 milligram per kilogram, complete survival is achieved in this model compared to 100 uh, percent mortality in the control group. This is another study, uh, uh, chronic osteomyelitis due to staph house. This study was performed by our collaborator in Germany. In this study, the treatment starts three days after the infection. And you can see the results, the, the loads in the tibia was reduced in the nanopyrotin group compared to the free and the blood liposomes. And in terms of the animal well-being, I6 levels is similar to that of the uninfected the mice in the nanomopyrotin group. And there is increase in body weight in the nanomopyrotin group compared to the free and liposomal and the blood liposomes. Additionally, we looked for the concentration of mopyrotin in the organs. So in the free mopyrotin, not non uh, no drug was found in the organs compared to high levels in the nanomopyrotin group. This uh, endocarditis, uh, rabbit endocarditis uh, study was performed in UCLA. And here again, uh, there is a comparison of the survival between frimopyrotin and the control. Complete, uh, no survival at all compared to 57% of survival in the nanomopyrotin group. And uh, uh, lung infection models perform TNT and spores over the NIH. Here we can show that in terms of uh, the bacteria in the lung, nanopyrotin was as active as vancomycin in reducing the bacterial count in the lungs. In order to look for the possible activity of nanopyrotin in gonorrhea, we first look for a qualitative study in which we injected the frozenly labeled nanomopyrotin IP to mice. And two hours later, we took a swab, a vaginal, a vaginal swab and smeared it and looked under the microscope. And here in this uh, short movie, if you follow the, the white arrows, you can see bacteria of the normal flora in the vagina, which uptake, uptake, the, uptake in the labeled nanomopyrotin and is fast, Moving here in this short video, I hope you can see it. 
And this was an indication that nanopyrrocin itself reached the vaginal secretion and may be active there. And this study was followed by a quantitative study, a PK study that was performed again in mice following IP injection. You can see here the concentration of mupirrocin, total mupirrocin in plasma and swabs. You can say that in the swab, the concentration at all time points tested up to 24 hours were around 10 microgram per gram in the vaginal secretion, which is above the MSC of gonorrhea for mupirrocin, which is 13 nanogram per ml. If we look at the, of the PK profile of nanopyrotin versus remopyrotin, you can see the huge difference, which explains in part the activity of nanopyrotin by injection. Remopyrotin is rapidly eliminated from the circulation with half life of about five minutes, and nanopyrotin is eliminated in half life of more than four hours. And in terms of the exposure, the AOC was around 100 times higher than the remopyrotin. So uh, above the, the activity as, as itself, the nanopyrotin has the advantage of a better pharmacokinetic profile. A ratotoxicity study was performed in ITR, Canada. And in this study, three dose groups, three IV dose groups were tested and one dose group for IMA injection. And the drug was given three times a week for two weeks. The toxicity results are shown here, but uh, the bottom line was that the NOEL was determined to be the highest dose tested, which for IV administration was 100 milligram per kilogram, which is much higher than the efficacy dose, effective dose. The toxicokinetic following IV administration is presented here. We can see that um, the exposure to the drug increased linearly with the dose. And there were no differences between male and female, no on day one versus day 14. Importantly, over the time points tested, the 48 hours, all, at all those groups, the level was above one microgram per ml, which is the MAC for staph, strep uh, species. And, and uh, the, what, the levels were above 64 microgram per ml. In, enough long periods. And I mentioned this number because this is the, the case of staphylococcus, which are um, the highest uh, MIC for staphylococcus that are um, resistant to mopirotin. So we can treat this uh, group as well. The PK profile following IM administration is uh, shown here. And you can see that it's very different from what we received after IV administration. It is characterized by similar values over the tested time points, indicating slow absorption from the injection site and allow long and sustained exposure to the drug. I put here the numbers just to, so, to show the ranges, uh, which are really similar over the, the time points that were tested. So if we summarize, we found identified opiotin as suitable for nanoliposomal delivery by computation methods, and it was proven. And it was demonstrated that in vivo, the nanoliposomal carrier allowed the efficacy of mupirotin by injection as opposed to the free drug. And having a unique mode of action and no cross resistance, it has the potential for treatment of several infection types involving multi-resistant bacteria. And nanomupirotin showed a very good safety profile in rats and the free mupirotin has extensive tox data, including IV administration to healthy volunteers the PK profile, it was found to be above the MIC in plasma over a long period, and it was found to be biodistributed to the infected tissues in several models. And therefore, nanomopyrotin has benefits from established antibiotics on one hand, and the other end using liposomes, which are very similar to Doxil, the anti-cancer drug product. Crazy is one of the inventors that is now used for the treatment of over than 700,000 patients globally. And in, in light of the, all, the, all the lectures that we hear before about the really big issues about antimicrobial resistance and the, the, the difficulties to find new molecules with new mode of action, this is an opportunity to, uh, to it's, it's an opportunity to find a molecule which is already available 
And therefore, now pyrotin may, be may have considerable potential and low development risk. I would like to thank all whoever were uh, part of uh, this project, first for the Baranauts group and Chesi, especially. And most of the studies here were uh, sponsored by Integra Holdings and the NIH. And all these uh, groups that are mentioned here were related to the results that were presented in. Uh, this presentation. And thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you, Aufa. Thank you, thank you. It was a good presentation as I expected. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to add just one small thing. So I think that other talk about the impact on the environment one nice thing about uh, mupirotzin that it's easily degradable under <laughs> broad spectrum of, of, uh, of conditions. So it will not survive the environment and therefore there is no uh, risk that, you know, it will be accumulated and cause resistance. I think that's, now we open it for questions. Okay, it's become a custom and I hope we'll get a, a very vivid uh, discussion at the end. We are coming today to tower the end. We have two more speakers. There is a change in the order. Now we, the next speaker will be Inge, Inge Herman, and then uh, we end up with, uh, with Noam Emanuel. So let's go to Inge. Inge uh, will talk about uh, inorganic antimicrobials, nanoenzyme combat bacteria hiding within human macrophages. Uh, okay, so we see how this meet, match with what we show about macrophages. Uh, and <clears throat> Inge is assistant professor at the group, group leader at uh, ETH Zurich and EMPA. Inge, Inge is a chemical engineer with additional training uh, in preclinical and clinical research. After graduated with a PhD from ETH Zurich, she underwent to various places for training with and, and she's uh, heading a research group at EMPA specialized on nanoscale material and devices for healthcare. Inge, go ahead, please. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and yeah, we, I'm gonna change gears a little bit and move away um, from organic structures to inorganic antibiotics and also to fully like basic research. It's still early stage. Um, but uh, I'm excited to, to have a discussion later on about where uh, there might be potential. That's fantastic. All the, all the applied scientists need some basic science <laughs> so they yeah. can move it forward. It's really early stage. So, so um, we, we tackle like uh, the challenge of wound healing uh, in general and also, of course, um, the, the challenges associated with infections. And we thought about how we can engineer a material um, that addresses different phases of wound healing and also fights um, microbial infections. So um, we started with a system that was purely based on inorganic materials and we built some uh, hierarchical structure to get um, orchestrated uh, release and, and morphological changes so we can um, address the, phase, the different phases of wound healing. And we uh, produced this um, inorganic nanostructures by a, a process called flame spray pyrolysis. This process is really versatile and it allows us to incorporate all kinds of inorganic materials and combine them in a in, um, pretty versatile manner so we can create hybrid structures and coarse shell structures of different materials that might have interesting biological activity. Um, of course, it profited a lot from the existing research so many researchers have described interesting properties for a variety of inorganic components. And um, we 
we created a blend um, made out of bioglass, which is bioactive ceramic used in a hard and now increasingly also soft tissue engineering, and uh, cerium oxide, which is a known um, nanozyme. So it's an enzyme mimicking inorganic structure with interesting uh, properties. And created some sort of hybrids with different morphology and structure combining these two uh, materials. Um, and the nice thing about our process is that we can actually control oxidation state of the cerium oxide quite well. Um, this is important because the oxidation state governs uh, biological activity. So it's a complicated craft to say a simple thing. So we can basically uh, control oxidation state of cerium oxide. So you can see here uh, Raman spectra and showing the oxidative effects. Let me just move on. Um, so after like getting a hold on uh, our synthesis process and uh, control over the properties of the particles, we wanted to actually test their feasibility for biological applications. And because this was supposed to be a tissue adhesive initially, we first tested that tissue adhesion in simple lab joint um, tests. And we could see that um, whereas serum oxide has relatively poor tissue degree uh, adhesion, bioglass has fairly strong tissue adhesion and actually unifying it too gives us the, the adhesion properties of bioglass. So we can claim that we get fairly strong tissue adhesion, especially compared to uh, fibrin glue, which is some sort of clinical gold standard at the moment. We then also were interested, especially in this wound healing environment, if, if these particles have effects on blood clotting, and they do. So having large surface areas of charred particles uh, typically increases blood coagulation, and we get um, decently short clotting times for these particles, both bioglass and cerium, and also the hybrid compared to like vehicle control, which is PBS in this case. So we get also rapid hemostasis, and then additionally, of course, uh, what would be um, important is also the effects of, of cerium oxide on the cell survival. So this cerium oxide has um, nanosyme uh, activity, and it can, depending on the chemical environment, it can either scavenge or generate reactive oxygen species, and in this case. It can, um, it can save cells from excessive reactive oxygen uh, species or, or oxidative stress in general. So these hybrids are also like cell protective, mainly and cell protective to some, to some extent. But we were really excited about um, the, the materials and the microbial properties. So first we um, look at these antimicrobial properties in a very simple, um, uh, suspension test and we we look at different microbes and we could see that um, these cerea, cerea containing particles um, ha have some antimicrobial activity and this also again depends on the oxidation state of cerea so low serum 3 um, plus surface content um, results in high um, bacterial antibacterial activity. And this also uh, holds true for intracellular pathogens. So we saw very nice videos in the talk before me. I don't have these nice videos, <laughs> um, but we also saw some antimicrobial activity of these particles inside macrophages. Um, to cut a long story short, um, we saw that because these are nanoparticles, they might be taken up in a similar way to bacteria in the, these macrophages and can in this way um, tackle um, bacteria containing cells which are otherwise difficult to reach with non-nanoparticle antibiotics. And it's indeed what is happening. So we can see that these bacterial, these uh, nanoparticles lead to the membrane um, disintegration of this, in this case, MRC bacteria intercellularly in human macrophages. Um, so we can also block the uptake of these particles. So if we have uh, if we look at bacterial growth intercellularly and we have these particles, um, so they slow down the, the, inter the intracellular bacteria growth. And if we revert this process by blocking the uptake of the nanoparticles by side or D, um, we don't get this antimicrobial activity anymore. So this really indicates that actually the entering of these particles into these macrophages is crucial for the activity. And yeah, nicely enough, these, these particles are non-toxic. This is in contrast to silver containing particles. We also look at silver containing particles, but they're considerably more toxic towards mammalian cells and can in this way not be applied. Um, at least a sweet spot is, is much narrower for silver based um, nanoparticles. Um, 
actually this, these are in vitro uh, data but they might work also in vivo because these particles are actually nicely ending up in macrophages so this is in a rat model of a, of a skin flap we can see that these particles in the end accumulate in macrophages and they also stay in macrophages over extended periods of time after topical applications in contrast to IV applications where of course they um, they would go mostly to the liver and the spleen so what's maybe more exciting um, is that these particles cannot only um, be applied as suspension, but they could also potentially be coated on implant surfaces, um, especially interesting, of course, for dental implants, which, uh, which face the problem of uh, bacterial infections quite, quite commonly. And this is a massive um, problem because it leads to implant failure. And we thought um, in a collaboration with Straumann, which is dental implant manufacturer, we thought that we could probably spray these particles, these hybrid particles, directly on implant surfaces and in this way obtain antimicrobial implant surfaces. So this is how these implant surfaces look in scanning under chromal microscopy. You can see um, that this yields relatively homogeneous uh, coatings, coatings that are relatively homogeneous over large surface areas. Um, especially for the bioglass containing coatings. And the Syria, pure Syria coatings, they have some cracks, which is unfavorable in that sense. So we will focus on these hybrid coatings. And we can see that we form a nice uh, fiber network. If you incubate these uh, surfaces with human blood, we can see that there's a nice fiber network formed. And also um, these coatings exhibit some angiogenic activity as seen in this tube formation assay. Um, so they perform quite similarly to vascular endothelial growth factor, which is which is nice in this case. Um, they also exhibit quite potent antimicrobial activity, as seen here, especially also compared to the like commercial implant surfaces. Um, we got some quite potent antimicrobial activity for the Syria containing implant surfaces, which is nice. And at the same time, they showed decent mammalian cell toxicity or at least mammalian cell compatibility, I should rather say. Um, there was slightly low result numbers um, compared to commercial implants, but there's at the same time also higher antimicrobial activity. So we're looking at this a little further. So I'd like to conclude by saying that these nanoserial based particles, especially the hybrids, offer opportunities to unify mammalian cell compatibility and antimicrobial activity. And they might offer an alternative to um, commonly used silver, copper, or zinc um, kind of systems. And of course, like more research is uh, needed in order to understand the mechanism for action, like the environment dependent activity of Syria, um, which depends on pH and many other factors, and also long term effects, um, and also degradability, bioaccumulation, and so on. So, with this, I'd like to really um, thank the team, um, the funding, and uh, of course, your attention. Thanks a lot. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Okay. Uh, it's really interesting to see uh, so many different approaches that we can use and need a lot of support to really try to see which is, which of them is really uh, good enough to go into the clinics. I think we very critical to get at, uh, this kind of uh, evaluation. And uh, I hope you will get enough funds so you can continue and go to, uh, to more uh, extensive uh, animal study, toxicology, real toxicology, and other thing which start to cost a lot of money. That's really very important. I hope the Swiss are uh, good enough to, to give you this money. From my experience, that's not always the case, but sometimes it works. Uh, anyway, it was really nice. And uh, any question to Inge? Okay, so we go to our last speaker for tonight before we go into the discussion and uh, again I have to say that for uh, full disclosure Noam uh, Emmanuel was my PhD student and after he, he finishes uh, after he became a PhD he went immediately to industry 
And after uh, through this time, he came with an idea uh, and he consulted with me a lot about it. And the idea was uh, the basis for uh, founding Polypid. I let him talk about it, but he has uh, now a lot, a lot of experience. He's now the president and the CSO of uh, Polypid. And the company now is at quite advanced stage. And we all the kind of holding our fingers that the clinical trial, that the large clinical trial will be a success. So you can help us with uh, holding your fingers. Noam, go on the stage. I don't see you. And uh, the, the stage is yours. No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. great, great. OK, thank you, Hezi. Uh, and thank you for the organ organized committee and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and for, for this stage, very important stage. And I will present uh, uh, not polypids, uh, but uh, a certain product, a specific product, the leading product we named Diplex. Uh, in, in the company, as said, I'm the chief scientific officer of the project. Okay. First of all, uh, the field. The field is uh, SSI, what we call surgical site infection, means infection that are related to surgeries. It's a very common uh, phenomenon. It's a very common disease uh, or condition. Up to 30% infection in some of the, of the, of the surgeries and very, very costly. You can see 10 billion annually in the US and similar numbers in euros in Europe. So it's a very serious uh, situation. Uh, what we do today for to prevent SSI, we are in prevention, not in treatment. So there are many activities taken, skin preparation, antiseptic, uh, wound care, etc. But one of the most efficient is systemic antibiotics. So what is going on with systemic antibiotics? First of all, it's easy to do. Uh, the physician, the surgeon will give systemic antibiotics via the, the veins half an hour to one hour before the surgery in order to load the site of the, the incision uh, uh, with antibiotic as much as possible before surgery. Because after surgery, when the knife goes down, actually blood supply is not stopped fully, but uh, deteriorate and, and become less and less. And therefore you cannot load more antibiotic into the site, at least for a very significant period. And that's the time or the, the window where bacteria can grow and, and can generate a society. So therefore, the strategy for post-operative systemic antibiotic is not very useful. It's well documented uh, because of lack of pen penetration from the systemic into the site. First of all, because there is low penetration to begin with, but then comes the surgery and even limited that more. Therefore, local delivery will be supposed to be a very uh, beneficial attitude or, or way to treat the site with the local reservoir directly in the wound. And by that, to release antibiotic, not via the circulation, but directly directly where it's needed in the wound itself. So for that, we develop technology we name PLEX. PLEX stands for polymer lipid encapsulation matrix. That means we have polymers on one hand, very well known in the art, but also lipids, also well known in the art and the API. And there is no connection between them, no uh, uh, chemical bonds. So first of all, to develop a product based on Plex technology, first of all, you need to select the composition of the raw materials. There are many polymers, there are many lipids. You can make thousands of combinations, but you can now select and optimize the combination you want to, to make to fit that to the, to the API and to the medical need. So what we do here is self-assembly, as said, no chemical bonds. So from non-order liquid stage into a solid stage, highly order matrix. Actually, what we get here is alternate layers of polymer and lipids, polymer and lipids, one after the other, and the nanometric level, where the drug will be entrapped in each layer. So each layer will have 
both Polymer, Lipid, and the API. So the production is going into a very highly older matrix by self-assembly. And what is nice here, it's also that water cannot penetrate through the layers. That means in vivo, all the drug reservoir will be fully secured within the uh, hydrophobic environment. So now how we release the drug? In the body, just by body water, body temperature, only the outer layer will be hydrated and then will disintegrate. And by that, we'll release the drug within this specific layer. Now another layer can be attached or touching the water. And again, with the same condition, we'll release the drug again, layer by layer, typically thousands of layers like that. So we can control by that, first of all, the duration by the number of layer, but also the rate of degradation of the outer layer, and also the exposure with the same menace, but also together with the amount of drug per layer. So we have control over the exposure. Now, what is out there with the local drug delivers? And this is local. You want to load that specifically at the site needed. So what is available is commonly some uh, mechanism that release the drug very quickly, what we call burst release or very quick release initial, and then very sharp decline over hours to several days. That's very common out of the therapeutic window. The blue line will represent the ideal exposure to what we want to hit the therapeutic window over extended period as needed. And this can be days, can be weeks, can even several months. And that's exactly what we can do with the Plex. We can tune the release rate and the duration, and by that to tune the exposure to the drug locally. What type of drug are suitable to the Plex technology? Actually, we tested many small molecules, but goes to peptides, even antibodies and proteins and nucleic acid, sRNA, even more than one drug in one uh, application. So all of these combinations are also possible with the Plex. But let's go to the antibiotics. Sorry, I'm jumping. Here we, are, we present the Diplex. Diplex, of course, based on, on the Plex technology. And the active here is doxycycline. Doxycycline is a broad spectrum antibiotics. And the release profile will be, again, constant, linear release. And the release rate will generate optimized to generate very high local concentration of the drug. And over four weeks constantly at the site, uh, the presentation before show four weeks for, uh, for healing the wound. So four weeks is very beneficial to prevent infections. Doxycycline is a very old drug. It has five decades of history, uh, central medicine of the WHO, but most important, it's broad antibacterial activity for gram positive and gram negative. And because we are now in prevention, we want to make sure that we have something that can prevent any type of bacteria we're like going to encounter during surgery or after surgery. Also with, uh, with uh, doxycycline, it's good for MRSA, and very helpful in vancomycin resistant bacteria. And actually, most of the urgent and serious due to the CDC uh, bacterial strain are susceptible also to doxycycline. The mechanism is bac bacteriostatic, but in high concentration, as we show and also others showed, it's also bacteriocidal. So here I can show you. Uh, a very nice image, I think, that we are working for one year for that to show what will be the actual uh, exposure in vivo, in this case in rabbit, inside the tissue for doxycycline. And on the left, you can see soft tissue, abdominal, and here you can see that it does exactly what we think it should. It means it keeps constant concentration over prolonged period, as you can see, over 30 days constantly and then decline. About 36 microgram per ml is generated in this model. Now you can see the blue line below, that's the systemic. You can see several dimensions below that. That means we keep it local, very little dosage circulation, and that's of course very beneficial. On the right, you can see a bone, sternal bone, the same ID, the same performance, and actually uh, the drug will work properly in bone and soft tissue as well. So here we tested the same uh, the same ID again, bacteria in uh, in different tissues. 
abdominal tissue and bone model against general tissue, different SSI-related bacteria like E. coli, of course, uh, MRSA, vancomycin resistant, etc. But you can see in orange that we tested also bacteria that are resistant to doxycycline. The MIC started for 15, but goes it to 31, and that's relatively very resistant for uh, doxycycline. And again, all of them were eradicated in vivo. So what we think about the mechanism, how we can eradicate resistant bacteria to doxycycline. Uh, doxycycline, uh, the mechanism, uh, the classical mechanism will be efflux uh, mediated uh, pumps. So that means actually the bacteria as, as mentioned earlier, uh, is ready to go against uh, poisoning by one of the ways is to pump the antibiotics outside the cell. But now when you have high exposure, that means high local concentration over extended period, and in this case, four weeks, that can overwhelm the pump and actually kill the bacteria, regardless of the pumping out. The overall dose of Dictrex uh, in vivo in humans is uh, 55 to 164 milligram. That's very minimal because it's only once. Only once during surgery, I'll show you immediately, but the daily dose will be 200 milligrams. It means less than one daily dose once in the wound will sufficient for four weeks exposure. When you go to the systemic, you'll need much, much, much more. Now I'll show you a, a little bit uh, in vivo. On top, you can see a sternal bone uh, in, uh, in surgery and below soft tissue and you will see how easy it is to use Diplex. First of all, it creates a paste, a paste that can be loaded immediately during one, two minutes on top of the bone and top of the soft tissue. Very, very intuitive, very easy. Wherever Diplex is, it will not shift. It will be fully degraded after it will do the job. You don't need to take it out. And very, very easy to use. The only instruction is to load Diplex one to two millimeters thin layer on each side of the wound, and actually that's it. And that's very important to think about usability because in the end of the surgery, that's a very urgent uh, timing for the surgery. They need to do everything very, very quickly. Now you'll see below, that's in abdominal uh, colorectal surgery. Here you use spatel, but it's really not needed. But anyway, they can do whatever they like, as long as they keep thin layer of Diplex on every corner. Okay, so that's some of the indication, the clinical indication we tested with the Diplex products. First of all, abdominal surgery is colon resection, where there is very high infection rate. Open heart surgeries, as I show you, Perimplantitis, that's treatment of chronic infection, open fractures, that's treatment slash prevention, I won't go into that, and even osteomyelitis. So we encounter with the doxycycline together with Diplex, environmental flora, hospital related, skin, oral, GI, osteomyelitis, with all of them with very good results. So let's go to one of the studies, phase two uh, randomized trial, uh, for abdominal surgery, colorectal uh, resection uh, with one. Uh, this is one of the highest SSI rate, over 20% SSI in this indication because contamination comes from the bowel and also from the environment uh, later on. So you can see two arms, double blind, as say controlled, uh, one with stand of care, either with or without uh, the addition of Diplex on top of stand of care. The primary endpoint is SSI and mortality in combination because of the FDA rec request. And that's in 30 days and 60 days for, uh, for safety. And most of the patients were cancer patients. Uh, most of the surgeries were laparoscopy and some laparotomy means larger incisions. And here you can see the top line results. On the left, you can see uh, the overall results. 24% uh, of events, uh, mortality and SSI in the control was a very nice drop of 59% reduction, very significant in the, in the duplex arm. 
uh, when you go to the right, you can see open laboratory. That's been high risk procedures. And again, 74% reduction, very significant. Also in this type of patient, look at the uh, percentage of, uh, of events, 45% in the control. That means one out of two will be either infected or will die. It's not only a matter of number, it's also a matter of quality. That means with a SOC, you can see superficial SSI, you can see mortality, you can see also deep SSI, whereas in the SOC and diplex group, you see only superficial, and of course, in lower number, and that's also very important. Uh, mortality, as said, five people died during this, uh, this uh, uh, um, study, all of them, in the control group. None of the patients die in the diplex arm uh, over 60 days. Uh, severe adverse events, uh, generally well tolerated. There are no confirmed drug-related uh, adverse events, as severe adverse events. Wound healing was uh, also very well taken. There was no increase in wound healing or no wound healing issues related to the product. Uh, that's the PK. You remember in animals, very, very low exposure, the same in humans. Here you can see both the abdominal and the sternal, and you can see a very, very low exposure, much below the systemic that's in orange, uh, actually below, typically below 100 nanograms in the circulation, but over 30 days. That means we have the exposure and uh, the leakage uh, or the, the shift into the circulation is very, very minimal. Uh, we also tested what it means uh, prolonged exposure to antibiotics uh, in a distal area, not in the wound itself. That means, in this case, re uh, rectal swaps. And we showed that, to begin with, the patient doesn't come with significant uh, concentration of resistant bacteria in the bowel to begin with. But then, even after 30 days, with the stock and with Diplex, there is no really a change. That means Diplex is not interfering with the uh, distal area and bacterial in distal organs. But, a huge but, uh, MDRs, including doxycycline resistance, were very, very common in this uh, in this uh, uh, wounds. Actually, 70% of the infected bacteria were resistant to more than one antibiotics. Uh, both in the control and in diplex. And uh, many of them, as said, about 25% were also resistant to doxycycline. We don't believe that 25% of the people were exposed to doxycycline. And that means that is what said by uh, earlier by uh, uh, Professor Adayonat, that they are coming ready to go. Means they are coming with the machinery that can allow them to prevent being poisoned. And we can see that very, very nicely in this indication. And, but remember that in the in the in the rectal swab we didn't find them, so most probably they are very very common as nosocomial from the hospital. But we see them in the wound very very nicely. But we know difference between control and diplex. Here we show only bacteria that are doxycycline resistant uh, in the wound. But what is really interesting here, not only that there is no difference between the, the control and diplex, but also in the most severe uh, uh, cases of SSI, there was no bacteria that were resistant to doxycycline in the, in the, in the diplex group. That means uh, I'm not so impressed from the no, but I'm impressed that there is no advantage to the bacteria that is resistant to dox doxycycline against diplex. And that's actually was our theory to begin with. So just a few words about what the FDA recognized about Diplex, to fast track designation, to a qualified uh, infected disease product uh, designation for Diplex, and recently also breakthrough therapy designation, taking all drug and do what we call new tricks. Uh, we are now in three phase three studies, uh, two of them in abdominal colorectal resection, the most infected, where actually uh, there were several attempts not successful 
uh, with other uh, products in this indication. So we really hope that the phase three uh, will be successful. We are waiting for the results. Uh, we already recruit altogether about 1,000 patients and we are, we are expecting results uh, when the time will come. Uh, shield one and shield two, as said, in abdominal colorectal and one in, in uh, bone tissue, internal bone, open heart surgery. We have a younger program in, uh, in oncology. I won't go into that, uh, but uh, that takes also advantage of local delivery, controlled delivery locally of chemotherapy. So just to close the circle from ID to practice, this is our GMP uh, facility here in Israel in Petr Tikva near Tel Aviv, uh, 1,000 meters square, actually more than that, of uh, GMP uh, approved by European uh, community, also approved for US use in clinical, and I hope that later on also for marketing. And uh, with that, I will thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Noam. It was a nice presentation and you succeeded in a short time describe all <laughs> the project from the beginning to the clinical trial and for the future with the plans. That, that's very good. Uh, and any, any question to Noam? Okay, I I think uh, yet. I have one little question about. Okay, the, good, good, good. Go about, ahead. Okay, yes, about, about the resistance, you showed that the, the level in the plasma are very low, of thirteen days, thirty days. Is it something that uh, maybe uh, worry, something to be worried for a res from resistance prospect? Yeah, absolutely uh, acceptable to uh, to uh, to test that in distal areas, and that's what we did with the rectal swabs. Actually, we try to answer exactly that. If there is a prolonged exposure over thirty days, even to a very low concentration. Okay, good. 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 Hello. Okay, now it's better. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yes, it is, uh, it is something we need to check, and that's what we did with the rectal swaps. What we did is trying to look if there will be a change in the, in the level of resistant bacteria in the bowel after this exposure, prolonged exposure. And we didn't, and we didn't, see, we didn't see any changes, so we are less worried. Uh, and uh, another thing, we are only using doxycycline you know, at the end of the day. And doxycycline is, I won't say not important, but uh, let's say not the first line. So anybody can look after that to penicillin, to vancomycin, to whatever he likes. You know, doxycycline is mainly for acne. So, uh, <laughs> so we can neglect that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think, uh, Biet, do you want to say something? and remind people how to go to the discussion. Now I'm here, yes. Well, um, before we go to the Zoom room, I would like to say to the entire community which is still there, thanks a lot. We know that this is stressy to go into the evening but we had such a full program and there were so many who said, I also want to be at Klinam, but I want to speak. So all in all, finally, we are 140 speakers out of 380 people. So my ideal would actually be to make a conference where everyone can speak. That would be probably the nicest. This is the end of the second day we go now to the Zoom room. You have here a link in the chat where you can see how to enter uh, the room. And then we shall probably have many people 
who still have questions to you. Okay, but before before we go, I want to thank all the speakers for the excellent performance and the broad spectrum of issues that were discussed in this session and presented by you. I'm very happy to see very young people that gave talk and and you know I just have my 81 birthday so quite a broad spectrum and uh, let's go to the discussion and hopefully we learn some new things and thank you very much again and thank my you for father, all the audience that bear with us for such a long time. My father told me at 81 that then you become younger again so <laughs> you have a good future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All the best. We see each other in the Zoom room.